It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Lori Gill and Renee Ritchie, they're back from WWDC. Andy Anako's back in the library. We're going to talk about all the things Apple announced last week at Lori and uh, Renee's take on it. The Big Mac, the cheese grater. How much? Uh, we'll play a little prices right. How much do you think the final maxed out price will be? We'll also talk about some surprising new features in iOS. There's a lot to talk about, and it's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 665, recorded Tuesday, June 11th, 2019. Leaning into the cheese grater. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. It's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash MacBreak. And by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Just remember your master password, and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. And by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at wordpress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at wordpress.com slash MacBreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news. Renee Ritchie back in town from his jaunt to the McHenry Center in San Jose. Welcome back, Renee. I am Leo, and I'm I'm all dub dubbed for you. I love that. Did you get the jacket <laughs> too? I yes, I got I got the except I got the black on black jacket. I didn't get one of the fun the fun. I think black on black though is the one getting the most money on eBay right now. Oh, is it? Yeah, because it's cool. Oh, Renee, you were complaining about it. Like eight or nine hundred dollars, <laughs> dude. Wow. Oh, uh, I, okay. Now I'm going to reassess everything, Leo. Because right? <laughs> other people like it better, I am now going to change my outlook on life. <laughs> That's <laughs> Laurie Gill, who is, who is also there uh, in uh, San Jose, managing editor of iMore. Hello, Laurie. Hi. I did get a Dub Dub shirt, but I didn't get the jacket. How did you all. not? Oh, because you didn't have tickets? No. I thought everybody I got the you. jacket. I had to sneak in. Oh, you snuck in. <laughs> yeah, we I had. I was at the keynote. I was able to go to the keynote, okay. but I wasn't able to. Oh, go Oh, you to the were pressed. That's why you weren't. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Also, Andy Anako, who like me, stayed home. Hello, Andrew. <laughs> well, yeah. well, that, I, I didn't know back then that it was possible to make WWDC revenue positive by just selling <laughs> the stuff you get for free. That seems like a bad. That thing changes. To do. That changes everything. I, I wouldn't want to get. Just quick story. Also, but also, they, they have scholar. Also, just no, just to. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say they had scholarship students and they began an underground discord network for the pins because the Tim Cook pin and the uh, black flag pirate ship pin were highly sought after. So everywhere you went, the scholarship guys were in discord trying to find all the different pins. It was amazing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Here's a, a ninth, uh, 2019 limited edition attendee jacket with pins. It's the blue one. Buy it now. $799. Oh, wow. wow! Yeah, I feel like I could spend seven hundred dollars more productively than that. Oh, but these but, jackets but, are so cool! Look at but them. I, but I, I do, I do have to say that like my usual excuse doesn't work quite as well because I used to be able to say, well, yeah, I could either spend like the thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars to fly out there and get a hotel, plus the sixteen hundred dollars to actually attend, or smug mode on. I could just like stay home and then buy the new Mac Pro essentially for free. <laughs> and now that I can't possibly buy a new Mac Pro for twice what I would be spending to go to WWC. Now I've got no choice but to, you know. I don't know. Those WWC. hotel prices, Andy. <laughs> those yeah, hotel prices they, were no they, they joke really this year. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty here bad. Is, uh, here is... Come to San Diego. It's cheap, they this said. This is the black and space gray. I think that's the one you got, right? Nine yeah. $950. Well, it is the Batman option. <laughs> it's stealth. <laughs> it's stealth. Reversible oh, black... It's pattern disruptive. It's well, like the it's like the skin they put on like uh, uh, pre production cars so they can take them out on the road without people photographing them. We had somebody in studio uh, last week uh, who had well, I showed it actually on the show, who had the jacket. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty nice. I yeah. Have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's rever the fact that it's reversible. They can like fresh Prince of Bel Air it. That's that uh, that uh, that impressed me. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it's important. It's well, San, it's well, San Jose, born babies. and raised. The playground is where I spent most of my. That's <laughs> the playground is where to, I spent most of my his, days. His, his uncle Phil <laughs> got him into like that's that snooty prep school, and then he thought like the, the the uniform jacket was like not flashy enough, so he started wearing it inside out, so that the satin red pattern ah, inside was the outside. So that's I what. Get it. 
I'm sorry. So that's ever since I refer to that as fresh princing it. I'm, I get I'm, it. I'm probably the only one. <laughs> and now, I so, don't realize it. Uh, of course, Not we spent a lot of time uh, last week talking about WWDC. Um, I, I am on record saying it was very exciting. I felt like Apple listened. I'm not alone. Marco Arment wrote a column saying Apple is listening. In fact, that was the, the title of his uh, com, col column. And he it ends, was the first time I couldn't type as fast as Craig was talking. Lori and I were just looking at each other going, slow down. What was on that slide? What did he just say? <laughs> and we literally, we've done this for like 10 years, Leo. And this is literally the first time I could not keep up with the man. <laughs> <laughs> I think Marco had kind of the same reaction I did, which is that Apple has really let the Mac, uh, you know, kind of drift. The Mac Pro was 2013, unupdatable. The, the Mac Book Pro, uh, as Annie and I have said before, with the touch bar and the keyboard really left let a lot left a lot to be no desired. No Mac Mini updates, no MacBook Air updates. Yeah, then all of a sudden they update the Mac Mini. They update the... Mm -hmm. And now the Mac Pro and uh, Marco's uh, final sentence is Apple is listening again. They've still got it. And the Mac is back. I'm optimistic for the first time in years. That's the uh, same reaction, Renee? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's been fairly evident since a uh, year and a half ago when they started putting all this stuff. When they started putting together the Pro Workflow team, I think was not just that the Mac was back, but that they, they started... For a while, I think there was this famous incident where Steve Jobs walked into the Mac lab and slammed an iPad down on a table and said, why can't you do this? And I think that set them on a trajectory to make the Mac more appliance-like and more mainstream because the Mac had never had a, a good share of its market and the iPad dominated its market. Right. And there was probably some thinking that if they just made it a little bit more like an appliance, a little bit more like an iPad, they could really take off. And they did get a lot of sales, but it was at the, it, it was at the cost of the traditional Mac market. And when they start, when they finally sort of realized that, when they came to terms with that, and they started assembling that pro workflow team, uh, and by the way, we all got a huge surprise walking into the hands-on area and seeing Dr. Wave from Pixar in his yep. new Apple workflow team jacket, showing off Maya and Hydra on one of wow. these new Mac Pros. Wow. I mean, they are super serious about the people they're recruiting. And I think that, because those people are yelling at them internally even louder than yes. we are all yelling at them externally. Yes, I think that's exactly uh, exactly right. Some have complained that there there is a big gap between the Mac Pro at the very, very, very high end and the MacBooks, that maybe there needs to be something in the middle. But that I think yeah. the iMac fits that. They though. go from iMac well, to iMac Pro to Mac Pro is their current. I mean, that's a fairly steady progression. No, Andy? Yeah, you don't, but you don't the, agree? No, well, be, because, I mean, uh, Rich Siegel had a really good post. Our friend, uh, CEO, and, uh, excuse me, one of the heads of uh, uh, Barebone Software, uh, had a really good post about how it's uh, the the sweet spot for developers for a lot of like the people who are not necessarily rendering a scene from the next DreamWorks movie. They just need to compile a really big app really really quickly, or they need to get through a production workflow much more quickly. What they have historically been very very well served by is three thousand dollars. Give us a box that has uh, user upgradable stuff in it. We're not necessarily saying that we need to be able to upgrade the CPU ourselves. That we don't need necessarily need to upgrade the power supply ourselves. But if we need to our, our if our change, if our needs change over the next two, three, four years, we need to be able to get inside there and add more storage, change out the storage, add more RAM, change out the RAM. Uh, even with the old uh, 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 Quaker Oats box uh, Mac Pro, it was possible to swap out the CPU for something else. Uh, but now that's just not possible anymore. The six thousand dollars does not make any uh, any sense whatsoever. He feels for his uses and for a lot of other people in his in his boat's uses. Uh, and now we no longer have that ability to say it's it's okay for Apple to say, well, here's your Mac Mini. It can be just as powerful as uh, as the Mac Pro that you probably would have bought anyway. But again, it is a sealed hot plate that is has minimal uh, upgrade ability. Uh, this is not what they really really need. And it's gonna. I, I do think I do agree with Rich. I do think it's gonna hurt. Apple in the long run, or at least the community in the long run, if these pro users who kind of they're 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 kind of like one of the one of those gravity wells inside the user base where they kind of pull the experience up for everybody because the needs that they have uh, in 2019 are close to the needs that other people are going to be having in 2020, 2021, and they they're how they are interacting with their hardware tends to sh give Apple lessons on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. So I do. Think Think that it's really really 
prominent gap in the product line that there is no $3,000 box that is user upgradable for people who, again, are not, pe are not people who are well served by a MacBook Air, uh, but also don't have or need to spend $6,000 on a bare bones Mac Pro anymore. How, no pun how does that relate to the yeah. iMac Pro, though? I, like, if you're talking about price-wise, if you're talking about a three thousand dollar computer, like, doesn't the iMac Pro suit that position? Well, because there, you're. Uh, it's still not easy to get into. Still not easy to upgrade. But the thing is, I. Uh, but if you're, the if you're spending I, the money the, on the it, though, the you're argument, already the upgraded. Argument, the argument I keep hearing is that you're making me buy a, this this expensive display. I don't want the expensive display. I don't need the expensive display. Why are you making me buy something I don't need? How much m less expensive would the iMac Pro be if I didn't have to buy this to me useless monitor with it? So it's, it's not it's well, not about and, simple actually, performance. And, and, it's about and, the, a form factor that works for your office for your workflow. And Lori, the iMac Pro starts at five thousand dollars so it isn't <laughs> it's, it starts at it's not that much less expensive than the mac pro it does feel like yeah, there's a one, there's a gap at the kind of three thousand dollars i think one of the things also is like back in back in the old the old days of the steve jobs quadrant literally almost anybody could use almost any mac there was only like four of them and right. you could feel like every new product was for you and starting with the 12 inch Maybe the MacBook Air, but certainly the 12 inch MacBook, Apple started putting out products that weren't for everyone. And I remember like almost the crisis that my friends went through when they're like, I can't use this 12 inch MacBook. And I'm like, well, there's a MacBook Pro right over that's perfect for you. No, but this is the new one. Um, and I, when any market matures, you start to segment. And absolutely, there is a gap between the Mac Mini and the Mac Pro, but previously that gap was huge. And now Apple's cut it in half by probably for the first time really catering to the absolute highest end pros, the ones that felt perhaps the most alienated, who the trash can certainly didn't serve. And maybe the original cheese grater could get close to there, but it was never it was never quite enough. And so they've sort of done the ultimate high end for like ILM and Pixar and people in, in universities who need the ultimate performance, just everything you can possibly get. Um, and they're not done with that Mac team yet. There's a new MacBook Pro on the way. And I, I went and I looked and See, I that might like be, old Ars Technica That might be your like, answer, by the way, Renee, is they're not done. And maybe, no, they're not. Maybe they're, you know, but people it, have wanted the mini tower forever, right? Like for 10 years, they've been asking for right. Apple for the mini tower and they've never done it. But I feel like now is the era where they might. Right. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, hopefully. But the, the major point, though, is that it's not just about performance, it's about form. That it's not enough to say that, well, this you can, you can, we'll give you an iMac or a Mac Mini that has all the performance of what would be the next incremental uh, cheese grater uh, original Mac Pro. Again, it's basically people who are, once you're spending above a certain amount of money, uh, I'll speak for myself, and I think that I also I think, think this is uh, conformity with a lot of other people. Above a certain amount of money, when you tell me that you're not going to give me what I want, and I know that I have good reasons for wanting what I want, that oh, I'll give you something that you'll like just as well, I'm like, but I'm trying to give you – I'm not going to spend $3,000 on something that I have to get used to. So just I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. not about just performance. It's all about here is a form factor that works for not only what I want to do today, but the way I'm going to be using a Mac on my desktop for the next two or is three years. Is there any chance they do that Mac Pro at a lower end, or is that really only going to be a high it's, end? It's super expensive for Apple to make, and even if a lot of developers bought them, they wouldn't sell that many. So right. like the – the, the math is like, do we do it? If we don't do it, it's, we save a ton of money. But if we decide we want to be in this business, this is what we have to sell it for. And who can we sell it to for that cost, including all the stuff we're putting into it? And it, it's also just quite possible that Apple will never be able to serve every market and that they're, you know everyone's going to have to. Apple's going to have to choose what they think that they can sell and developers are going to have to choose what they think they can support. And some of them might really want... Uh, specific things, but they might not be a big enough market to support them. So maybe Apple's answer is Mac Mini with an eGPU and a sat an external NAS and all these things. And they can say, no, we don't want that. If they make enough noise, maybe it'll make sense. But we, I think we are finally getting more and more pieces to cover more and more uses, but we'll never get them all at once. Well, they do a lower end display because they remember very famously a couple yep. of years ago, stopped making cinema displays. Now they have this Pro Display XDR, but it's six thousand dollars with stand. Will they make a, a less expensive version of this? Their current response to that, like, so there, there's what they say and what they'll do. So what they say is that there's never been a better variety of USB-C monitors, <laughs> and they all work great with new Macs. the The truth is that they. 
they don't do stuff just to do stuff. You know, I'd love them to make a router. It's one of the most important bits of kit that they don't make, in my opinion, right now. But it's, it's again, it's that math. It's like, can we make, like, is it worth taking the time and the resources with our with our limited amount of focus to produce something that's essentially a commodity? It's why they don't make a TV set. I, I'm My hope is, my dream is that they make these 6K monitors and they're pushing out a bunch of technology that people have just never seen before. Like the way they're using double backlights, mini LED, the way they're using blue LEDs and reconverting them, reconstituting doing them into white and just taking all those technologies, spending a year or two commoditizing them and then being able to take some of those things and making a display that is lower cost, but still it's still better than just slapping an, I, an LG panel into an <laughs> Apple chassis and saying, here you go. That's all we're doing for you. Who makes these panels? I, I don't know. I've not found a commercial equivalent for them yet. Interesting. It's quite possible it's Apple display outsourcing the the right. fabbing to another company because that was another complaint some people had as well they're just buying lg panels but i'm not it's not clear yeah. the, the no biggest issue i the biggest issue i have <laughs> with it is it, you can only use it with a mac pro right it doesn't have hdmi it doesn't have any standard no, you, so you can you can well you can use it with max um you can use it with the more powerful max in 6k mode you can use it with some of the smaller max in 5k mode uh, i think if you have some of the higher end imac pros and imax you can use the two of them. Um, and Blackmagic has announced a breakout box. So I forget, is it SDI, SL, whatever the industry standard is, you'll have a bunch of different ports on the outside of it. What's your response to people who said Apple shouldn't, uh, maybe Apple should make a $1,000 stand, but they should have never have told anybody. <laughs> uh, I think Apple would yeah, tell you that. Yeah. I think if you asked anybody at that thing, they'd say, I don't know how it got past Phil Schiller. I don't know how it got past Tom. I don't like, they watched this for days. Nobody understands how this got on there. Please, if we could just go back. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> I, 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 and honestly, it didn't bother me as much as I think it bothered everybody in the, in the uh, hall. And, uh, and obviously a lot of pundits. But it killed the whole segment. People were it loving did. that it segment, Leo. Yes. Just, it, it. It. But I also understood that pros, A, they're not that price sensitive, and B, they often don't want a stand. Alex Lindsay takes the stands, we used to take the stands off all the monitors and because he'd use uh, arms with the Visa mount. And it's, so it's like they didn't announce the wheel price, right? Just don't say it. Like yeah, it's the wrong audience. Because you know about they would have gotten right. heat because the wheels are going to be 500 bucks. Did minimum. you see the talk show yet, Leo? Because it starts off with Gruber looking at Jaws and going, So how much are the wheels? And Jaws just looks back <laughs> and goes, How many do you want? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Did he ever find out? No. <laughs> they haven't announced. I don't think they were going anywhere near that. They'll, never, the they'll never say. By the time you bought a $5,000 monitor, any extras yep. is, is, you know. Especially because most people will be buying this with a Mac Pro. Really, only you could say you can run it on an iMac Pro, but it, you know what's the point? If you don't yeah, have their, yeah. their positioning is that most times people in these workflows buy one reference monitor, right. like one of the Sony, that costs thirty and forty five. Yeah, yeah. And now in this case, they can buy seven, so that and right. not just so that people who are working on the footage can be color accurate, but so they don't look at their inaccurate displays That's and right. go bother the color guy and say this is wrong <laughs> when he knows it's the not. The whole chain can be accurate. So they're actually, I bet you, they uh, this these monitors might even outsell the Mac Pro. Actually, now that you mention it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The, th the it's a different thing from the argument about the about the Mac Pro itself. There are there if you want a cheaper monitor, the lots of alternatives out there but the people i've been talking about in the pro industry have been telling me that there's really nothing quite like this uh, on the market yet where you can't get this kind of quality this kind of uh uh <laughs> this kind of assurance that you're, you're 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 mixing these colors right for this kind of a price point uh and so i don't think that that's a controversial thing at all uh but i i am also curious to see uh, how, how much these wheels are going to cost compared to like going down to harbor freight <laughs> Because the, the doubles are wheels yeah, is because of be the, the pro workflows team because they're like, no, we have to. You don't understand. You got to roll it push around. These things off yeah. a truck. We got to move them around. Yeah. We need yeah. wheels. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, oh, can I can I tell on Lori for a second because it was it was delightful to me. We're standing in the hands-on area. Phil Schiller comes up to us and Lori goes, "Where can I touch that laser etch? That laser texturing? I heard there's a place around here I could touch it." And Phil's <laughs> like, I "I'm pretty sure not." And Lori's like, "No, no, no I really want to." <laughs> I touch need to it. touch it. I was like, "I don't." I don't think we let you do that. It was awesome. This is I, on the monitor. I got the my first chance to meet one of these Apple executives. And the first thing I said is, what can I touch? And that's why we <laughs> love you, Lori Gill, because you don't care. You don't care. Uh, I think that's the right. It's that's not, a it's, good question. It's not. It's not like the. It's not like the donuts in the conference room. It's not like if you touch it, now that's yours. That's. <laughs> <laughs> that was her plan. <laughs> yes, it's mine now. 
I'm going to lick it. I would have tried, tried it too. <laughs> uh, I, as soon as they mentioned that it was that the matte screen was laser etched, though, I immediately thought, well, what is that like? What is that going to yeah. be? Can I? Is that something that you'll be able to totally like? Could you scratch the screen and feel the laser etch, or will there be a glass covering over that? And if there is a glass covering over that, how does that affect the matte um, refraction? So, I mean. I feel like that was a it's legitimate question. Like, I want to know what that feels like when, when I, yep. you know, can you I? You just have to try it on the one you map? buy. That's the, that's yeah. the, yeah. So did you <laughs> see the two side by side? Cause there's a, there's a glossy and there's a yeah. matte, right? They didn't put any yeah. side by side though. But uh, uh, the thing is that like it, the matte screen, I have a matte um, ultra wide and, and it's, it looks matte. It looks like bl blurry, fuzzy kind of. Yeah. And the matte, um, Pro Display does not. I can tell the difference between the oh, two. The non-matte is definitely um, uh, sparklier, clearer, um, <laughs> brighter um, than the matte one. But the matte one on its own is the best looking matte screen I've ever seen. And I do use a matte screen, so I'm very familiar with like the differences between the two. I'm not just kind of like, I don't know what they look like. So um if you're a matte screen user, you're going to just love how clear that matte screen is. But when I would look at one in one room and then look at at the other one in another room, I could I could I could look at it and just go, oh, that's a matte screen and that's not. So, well, Lori was busy with the ADAs. I got to go to a Bake Off with the screens. So what they they put a um, Dell HDR display next to the ISO display, next to a matte Apple display, next to the regular Apple display, next to the $30,000 Sony display, next to the $45,000 <laughs> Sony display. And then they ran them through a whole gamut of testing. And the Dell one had good brightness, but it did it at the expense of color. Like you could tell compared to all the other ones, the colors were just way off. The ISO display, I think never got past 400 nits. So it was like really dark all the time. The Apple displays looked really, really good. The de the Sony displays had better peak brightness, but if there was any significant amount of light colors at all, like the, like the sun in the corner, a sky, you would get like 50 seconds to five minutes of, of, <laughs> um, of peak brightness, and then the light would change from green to orange meant that they were no longer in reference mode. So I'm guessing that's when people go get coffee and you have to wait a few minutes for it to cool down again. But the Apple displays can go at 1,000 nits forever and they can peak at 1600 nits, which isn't quite as bright as the OLEDs, but it, they can just persist, which is really important. My sense of this was Apple flexing its muscles, kind of like Ford building a half million dollar Ford GT. Most people yes. won't, you can't sell it to more than a few thousand people, but it shows that we, first of all, finally have the real answer to can't innovate my Hoo -hoo. Yeah. Patooties. my apps because <laughs> uh, <laughs> clearly this is innovative uh in fact it has a lot of technologies not just from apple but promise um and uh and radeon that uh yeah, it lets them ship really cutting edge yeah. technology yeah so it's a very just, cut, a neat it's not just another pc in other words I mean, just, just just what they've done with those GPUs is amazing. Hell, <laughs> it is amazing. And again, that yeah, was a, that was fabric. Radeon doing it, right? It was AMD doing it, not Apple. That were created for the f Pro buy. Right, but the but, but yeah, exactly. But the but the way that they've got these cards working together in a way that it's yeah. yeah I mean, it's a is that they, the, is that the fabric connector that that it's using? Infinity Fabric, but it's also the Apple uh, Mac extensibility. Uh, kind of uh, module. Okay, and these are new, right? There's no, there's no other Apple device that has. I've this never stuff. seen Infinity Fabric used for GPUs before. And I was talking about it with a friend of mine, uh, actually with George's husband before, that it's been used for their CPUs to put the chiplets together to get better performance. This is my first, the first time at least I've ever seen it applied to a GPU. And it's so the the Nvidia By the way, story, it's not it, Apple's technology. That's an AMD technology. No, it's Infinity an AMD Fabric. technology. But the the, the, the the reality was they were not going to be able to get Nvidia GPUs again because Nvidia still won't let them have direct access. To the to the silicon, the they still want yeah. it to go through. Yeah, they want them to go through CUDA, and that's very hard for Apple because, like, for VR, Apple gets everything out of the way, so you can write directly. For all the technologies like Metal and like the new Swift UI, they want they don't want you to have to care what card is there. They want it all abstracted away, so it just doesn't work. And so Apple said, well. We need performance, so this configuration of AMD gives us industry-leading performance, and we need compatibility, so we'll just get Hydra and all these other people. We'll show them this and say, you got a port. They're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, we got a port. 
Um, and then all that's left is like religion because some people just love CUDA and they'll never they'll never fight. They'll never be able to, to conquer that. But in terms of performance and in terms of compatibility, I think they've answered both those things. So Infinity Fabric is used by AMD and has been for a couple of years for their Ryzen chips. Yes. It makes me wonder why this Mac Pro doesn't have Ryzen in it instead of an Intel CPU. The I mean, it's. First, Intel owns Thunderbolt, so they would have to license it, which they may or may not be inclined. Okay. They have done it for some motherboard makers, uh, and Apple also might have a, an overall deal with Intel that makes it hard to do individual CPUs that aren't Intel. So they chose a – so the Ryzen's don't support Thunderbolt. They, it's an Intel technology, and Intel oh, has licensed it to some motherboard makers, interesting. Um, but there's, there's no – there's nothing that would compel them to license and it. Clearly, the pros, that's an important issue. In fact, we know Apple it is. Apple is all in on Thunderbolt. Because there's a ton yeah. of Thunderbolt ports yeah. on this thing. Um, on the top of the case. On the top, right. <laughs> there's two of them in the top of the case. Yeah. So what, what did they did they have to be stopped from putting all the ports on the bottom on the underside, <laughs> like with the Apple mouse? There's did, did internal USB-A in so that you can hide your dongles. Because some of the software, like Maya, still has hardware dongles to, to, to uncopy oh, protect So you can put them inside? You can put them inside so you don't have to look so at them. That's awesome. Again. That's so brilliant. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's um, also safe because, again, you're rattling around a studio. You don't want to knock it off or yeah. damage it. Or, yeah, know. or have somebody take it. Yeah. Um, by, but even by accident. <laughs> uh, I I just, I'm, I'm glad it looks like a cheese grater. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Even more. They, like, it, lent into it. Yeah, they, they yeah. leaned into the cheese grater. So does the back yeah. of the display. Um. I think it's beautiful. It's so my, much air. Initially, I looked at it and I thought, well, it looks too much like a cheese grater. It's kind of. Those are the matte ones, by the way. Those are the, uh, the matte That's the matte versions. screens? Yeah. Yeah. The nano textured matte. God, you, would you're you get be able the matte? Who has kids? Which would you. <laughs> I would get. Well, I, I, I don't think I'd spend a thousand on yeah. it, though. If they were the same price, I'd get the matte in a heartbeat, but I don't know if I'd spend a thousand bucks on it. Because the, the standard more. one looked fine to me and yeah. I'm used to standard displays. Yeah. But the color was just as bright as on a glossy. Yeah, and it doesn't have the rainbow effect either, which is really oh, nice. Oh, that's nice. No moiré. Yeah. Well, you can't have moiré. Who, who no. I feel like Apple, there is a huge opportunity for Apple with developers at this point. A lot of developers, you know, Microsoft clearly understands this. this is why they put a Linux kernel in Windows. But I still think that Microsoft's solution in Windows is pretty weak compared to Mac OS. Uh, in fact, my rec it, most developers I know would just buy a Windows machine and put Linux on it. Yeah. Uh, I think Apple has uh, developers still love Mac OS. There's a real opportunity here. I, maybe the Mac Mini solve, solves that or scratches that itch, but I feel like there's a real opportunity to say to developers, yeah, uh, we, we do make the best machine for any kind of development, even full stack web development. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't have to be for Mac OS, but of course, if you get developers with Macs, what are they going to develop? Especially with things like the uh, new, uh, that that amazing um, uh, Swift UI kit. Yeah, I feel like this is Apple. Don't has, you think like half the slots, Leo? Like half the size, half the yeah. slots with a make 5K a, make on a, a mini display, a mini yeah. Mac Pro. Yeah, I would yeah. love that. I would love that. Yeah. You know, and and the problem is, your mini doesn't have all of these interesting uh, technologies like Infinity Fabric and. Uh, this new technology, the promise. But maybe you could have just one rate. of those units. Like it doesn't have two. You can't fit two. Um, One's Mac plenty. I don't need four video cards. <laughs> yeah. Developers don't need any. Cards or one of these modules. <laughs> and that ASIC is pre-programmable, which is awesome. So yeah. like you can get that. That you can get that afterburner card and like figure out all sorts of fancy maybe, things to do. Maybe after Apple ramps up, did they say where they're going to make these? Are they going to make them in China? They did not say yet. See, I really wonder. Remember the the trash can Mac famously was made in Texas, uh, yes, and and that was somewhat problematic. I would these these, given the tariff situation, uh, the uncertain future with China, boy, these need to be made somewhere else, if you ask me. And not I believe Mexico Apple either. Display is, isn't Apple Display in Taiwan? I think yeah, I feel like seeing the, Apple Display is in Taiwan. The right answer. And then did Promise not create a new uh, hard drive module for them as well? I, I didn't see all the announcements. I saw the Black Magic one, but there was just a bunch of them coming out all at once. Yeah, I think Promise did make did announce that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, they're they're the internal hard drive sleds, which is the best name ever. That. Uh, but I mean, the the thing about this too is like all the YouTubers they're filming have like forty five thousand uh, dollar. 
or red cameras, and usually they have more than one of them. You're kidding. So very different market. Are you kidding than, me? Than ours are. No. I'm not, <laughs> there were YouTubers there with Alexa cameras? Yeah, Jonathan Morrison uses an Alexa. Um, MKBHD uses a red, not a red weapon, uses the new one, the red something or other. Uh, I forget the name of it. And when you watch their studio videos, there's like more than one mounted at a time. It totally wasted on YouTube, I might add, but okay, fine. They're, uh, they're, they're for the future of 8K YouTube. Yeah, videos. 8K YouTube, here it comes. So the, this, this promise technology is for uh, RAID. It's the Pegasus R4i. It fits in the MPX expansion slot. And so, you know, we all kind of laughed or choked when we heard a $6,000 Mac Pro with a 256 gig SSD. But yeah. that's just, that's almost just for your, uh, <laughs> that's for your scratch files. This is what you're going to put in there. <laughs> oh, so I, I asked about that. And the, the unofficial answer is that there are people who want nothing to do with any components that Apple would ever put into this box. Oh. So basically give them the least thing possible because the minute they get it, they're attaching it to their network right. of crazy storage and they're putting in their own car, their own video cards. You know, basically they just, they just want, this is a minimal buy-in for the Apple box. Right. <laughs> as long as it runs Mac OS, they're fine. They'll handle everything else themselves. Well, this promise, these promise uh, drive sleds contain four, uh, 7,200 RPM hard drives. So you could have eight of them times, what is the standard now, Three, four terabytes? So we're talking a huge yeah. amount of... If you want an internal storage, it's it's available to you, I guess is the point. And there's a rack-mountable version, Leo. I, I, You know what? That made my little heart go pit a I know, right? <laughs> it's like the X-Serve. All the X-Serve yes. love came flying yes. back to me. And I just, I'm sad that Alex Lindsay wasn't here. He was otherwise engaged. But I... I I did text him and he said, I said, are you, how many of these are you going to buy? He says, as many as I can get, but I'm going to have to put a second mortgage on the house because <laughs> it will be expensive. But this is exactly I'm, what Alex wanted all along. I messaged him and asked if he was getting the six pack or the dozen. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I think that this is the one Mac that unites everybody. because I think everybody is buying as many as they can afford. It's just that for 99% of people, of the Mac users, Zero is how many we can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody at this table. Uh, very few. Are, did any of the you know is Gruber going to buy one? No, I don't think so. Is no, uh, Marco's going to buy one for the summer house, one for the main house? Marco will buy <laughs> one. Syracuse is probably going to like. I think Syracuse is going to wait for Marco to buy it, and then you know see how it goes. Wow. But nice. all the video people there again, like there there were a bunch of people there, and Apple is smart on who they invite. There were a bunch of people there who work in this industry, and they didn't flinch at the price. All they cared no. about was availability. No, like price it doesn't is even, not it's a, a rounding no. error for them. And Alex has always said that. He said professionals, yeah. you know. In fact, a lot of people just charge it back to the client, which means the higher <laughs> the price, the more the markup, the more they'll make. So they don't care. A thousand dollars stand, great. That means more money in my pocket and I get a nice stand. <laughs> yeah. There was some confusion because some people were saying Apple had the stand on display, but that was an AR experience. You could walk up to the stand or oh, to the cube, oh, hold so up an funny. iPad and it would explode out and you could sort of explore all the different parts of it. That was very impressive, by the way, that <laughs> Safari. You go to the page for the Mac Pro at the bottom. It says, OK, open this in Safari and, and yeah. press this button and you'll see one on your desk. And it really worked well. I thought that was very impressive, yeah. actually. You have a picture of you with the, exp with the exploded all the parts exploded out. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Very yeah, and cool. there's some really, especially in that display, like the double backlight, there's some really interesting display technology going on there. What I mean, uh, we can continue to celebrate them. There is, there's your exploded image. We yeah. can continue to celebrate this Mac Pro, and I think it's well worth uh, doing. It is, I mean, this is something that I can't think of. Dell wouldn't do this. HP wouldn't do this. No, Pete, there's nobody else who could do this or would do it's this. It's the Huracan. I mean, Audi doesn't sell many Lamborghini Huracans, but you got to make a Lamborghini Huracan because it's, it's on top exactly. of everything else. Exactly. This is their race car. This is for the Formula yeah. One fan. Um, I think this also kind of answers that question or, the, or responds to the comment that you have heard of Apple isn't, isn't um, trying to... Um, work with the pros anymore like right. i think no, when when the spades. macbook pro yeah when macbook pro came out and even when imac pro came out there was a lot of this sort of general um ideas going around this floating idea that apple isn't trying to work with pros anymore and really they absolutely were and did it this year it just took them a while to make sure that they were and really they they made a mistake with the trash can Mac Pro and they did not want to make that mistake again. And that's why it took them so long. They wanted to make sure that 
you couldn't complain about anything. And of course, there's always something for people to complain about, but this is as close as you can get to having no one complain about it. Yeah, to their credit, they copped to that two years ago and they said, yeah. we're going to have something in 2019. We're gonna, it's going to take us a while, but we're going to fix that. So, uh, And they did. And uh, yeah. as, as Marco said in his uh, post, I'm optimistic for the first time in years. And for people like me who really love Mac OS, I am too. I just want to see some of these technologies trickle down into less expensive versions. I'd like to see Apple do other monitors, yeah. other displays. Uh, I would love to see a mini Mac Pro. I think that's a great idea. Uh, and, and Waves, I should mention Waves' demo was amazing because he had Toy Story 4. He had the set inside one of the little shops. And he's like, but you probably want to see outside the shop. Oh, so then man. suddenly you had the whole street. Then you probably want to see the entire fair and then oh. the entire fair. But you probably want to see the whole region. And then it zooms out and you see you're yep. in the entire part of the world. And he was zooming in and out and around and up and down all through Hydra. Just zero lag, zero anything. Amazing rendering capabilities. We're going to play uh, our uh, our version, of the MacBreak Weekly version of The Price is Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let you start, One dollar. <laughs> what? <laughs> I guess we should say full, well, do we want to say 1.5 terabyte of RAM? That's $20,000 by itself. Yes. Uh, do we the highest end GPU? If you buy the highest end CPU directly from Intel, it's seventy five hundred dollars. Yeah. So uh, actually, the platinum the platinum version of the Xeon W is ten thousand dollars. Yeah. And there's even some Xeon Ws at fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah. But that's onesie twosie. Apple's not going to pay the onesie twosie price. What do you think? Uh, fully maxed out, including the XDR display, including the thousand. How many stand, XDR displays? Leo? Just one. No, just one. We don't have to okay. go crazy. One display, one computer. But let's get the wheels. <laughs> Let's get the wheels. Oh man, the wheels. That's a wild card. It is a wild card. I'm I'm going to say 500 yeah, bucks a wheel. No, 500 bucks total <laughs> for four wheels. That's what I'm going to say. $125 each. Uh they could charge a thousand, but I think they'll I think they'll be reasonable. What do you think the top like if we go into the into the configurator and we could figure the heck out of this. What do you think? I'm guessing 50. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's, that's again, that's what these crazy YouTubers play for their cameras and I yeah. figure that they yeah. easily like If you're buying it yeah. Yeah. Lori, what do you think? Or red. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, well, are we maxing it out? Or are we, yeah. are we fully just maxed? Okay, One so monitor, so fully, fully maxed. maxed. Fully maxed. I'm going to say 65. 50, 65, Andy. <laughs> Uh, if this were Price is Right, I would definitely go fifty thousand and one dollar <laughs> because I think it's I think it's higher I think it's higher than Renee's I think it's lower. Than, you haven't than heard mine yet. I, I would I would see yeah, because you can go fifty thousand and two. Damn it, that's why you always do that when you're <laughs> you heard last. mine yet. Uh, I would say I would say about fifty five thousand. I think it's a little bit higher than fifty. I'm gonna say it's a lot higher because twenty thousand for the RAM. Let's yeah. say ten thousand for the CPU is thirty thousand. If I'm going to put two of those promised sleds in there, I'm a, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know. I'm going to say more like. Will eight. the promise be in the configurator, or is that going to be yeah. aftermarket? Is that an aftermarket? I feel like Apple announced it. Yeah, but I don't know if it'll be in the configurator. That might be in the accessory okay. section. All right, all right, all right. We won't put that in there, but we will put in four. Count them four Vega Pro cards. <laughs> oh, that's true. And four four terabyte SSDs. Are you gonna yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, I'm it's gonna go over fifty. I'm sure it's going over fifty. Okay. I think maybe I'm in a, a hundred leaps to mind, but that can't wow. possibly be that high, right? But honestly, the sky's be. the limit. It definitely tempts you to figure out how much does does that how much does it weigh in that configuration, and what precious metal could this be made out of where it would actually <laughs> cost less? That more Latinum, than silver, maybe Latinum. more than yeah. Oh, and by the way, that case and yeah, the way yeah. you can lift it and it's all open. I asked them because my uh, Nahela Mac Pro, uh, a friend of mine has put a Westmere in it already, but it's it's lasted ten years and it's still a. It's an awesome. It's, still, it's good. It's good and, a Mac as any Mac you can buy today. This is and really this reminiscent built of it. A lot, yeah, this is built so that you can upgrade it for ten years. So, can I mean, you upgrade you'll get the CPUs too? Can you upgrade the CPU? Un undetermined because I think a lot of that depends on what Intel does with the right with the CPUs. Uh, but I think theoretically you could upgrade the uh, some of the cheese grater CPUs. Yes, uh, we looked into that. I mean, it, 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 there is a limit because of the socket and the bus and all this. But yeah. this the socket is in, enclosed in a module, right? I I, I feel like you could. There's no, is there a logic board, a motherboard? No. 
There's a back plane, I think. There's a back plane. I think there's a back plane. And that's, I and that's where that, that fa fabric works to connect yeah. the stuff. I feel like what you created is this amazing high-speed bus that you can plug anything into. I mean, it really is mm. It's very impressive. I, I just, and it's like they, they were comparing it to red because like with red, you, you spend a ton of money to get the camera, but you can't take photos with it. Then you got to get like right. the memory module and right. the mounting module. And Jonathan was saying like his handle for his five is like 500 bucks. And that's just like the tiny grip bar. That but you that's what on. pros <laughs> want because yeah. pros want to yeah. configure it precisely for the job they're doing. That's what the Hasselblad was all about. It's the Hasselblad is yeah. a box with no lens, no film receiver, no not, no winder, no nothing. Yeah. But here's the interesting question. It was brought up on MacBreak Weekly uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago or last week, and you weren't here when I uh, and you were here, Laurie. So I'll give you you guys the first dibs at this one. What happens if Apple doesn't arm? You know, gets off Intel. I mean, I don't think they. Xeon is probably the last of the Intel that they'd get off of. Um, and their solution to that is probably going to have to be creative. I mean, I could eat my words. They could say, hey, for the last 10 years, we've been working on Xeon on ARM-based server architectures. Here they are. Uh, but I think... Yeah, how do you feel about Xeon, 64 ARM cores, huh? Now how do you feel? Yeah. Now what do you say? <laughs> but I, I think Xeon is like probably the most resilient of... Like if you're going to buy Intel at this point, right. I think Xeon is probably the And safest. actually, the <laughs> subsystems are just as important as the microprocessor in something like this. Uh, you aren't even really yeah. looking for high clock speeds as much as you are just for integration and the GPUs. And these are yeah. Cascade Lake, so I mean they're I mean they're still not they're still on the 14 nanometer process, but they're like they, they were announced the same day Apple announced Mac Pro. I just if I'm going to spend let's say fifty thousand dollars on something, it would be problematic if I thought in three years it would be obsoleted by a change in pro microprocessor architecture. There'll always be something new, though, and these machines are designed to last so long that you probably hit that. Like, even if you bought yeah. it last year or the no, year before, you probably still hit if that. Yeah. yeah. Ironically, the people who spend the most on computers are the ones who care least about longevity. It's well, they lease them, right? Like, they lease them yeah. for a year or two and then they go yeah, back they to the leasing care. company. Yeah, yeah. And that's when we're going to be able to get one. <laughs> it's like a Tesla. I can get the app. I, I can get slightly the used. MIT return. flea market 2029. Uh, oh. $80. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Andy. And I will count on you Not to pick one, one up for me when you see it. <laughs> Turn them into hamster cages. It reminded the, the, the me the, the way the case lifts off reminded me a little bit of the cube. The cube kind of yeah, is that. No, so that's, nice. it. that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. All four sides. It's amazing. Oh, it's just so sweet. Uh, thank you, Apple, for really, really, uh, li I think, really listening. I think they did. And I think all the all the quibbles about price and and all that are are really um, misplaced at this point because this is what Apple saying, "Look, what if price were no object? How good could we make this computer?" <laughs> we did we you had, see Marco's we, tweet from we the, have people in our marketing database that actually fits that description, so we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> did you see Marco's tweet from the hands-on area when uh, he sees Johnny and Tim? No. Oh, yeah, he, he put out, it was the same day as the event, and he just sees uh, Johnny and Tim, and he's like, you killed it, you killed it! And Johnny, like, doesn't know how to react, but Tim, like, puts his hands together and says, thank you, thank you, and he just says, you killed it! You killed it. Was, it. It was just a beautiful oh, moment. Oh, it, it, for people like, uh, like, I think all of us, but certainly uh, Andy and me who go back a few years, I love Mac OS, and I, I was, I have been very sad for some time. Uh, that they didn't um, they didn't seem to appreciate it as much as we who loved it so much. Marco says something well, changed ar around 2017. Yeah. That there was something big changed around 2017. And, and perhaps it was the trash can combined with a keyboard, combined with the touch bar, combined with, you know... Um, I'll, st I'll still say that they're excited about pro users. They're, they haven't shown as much enthusiasm for the people who have the need for your medium to low power sort of uh, computing. Uh, I do think that they still think that, geez, what are they? What are these freaks doing still buying a desktop uh, machine? We need to get these people convinced that they can buy iPads instead. So I've seen some good stuff in Catalina, which uh, which which pleased yeah. me a lot. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. still think that I really still want to see a lot of like enthusiasm jumping up on the stage, rending your garments like Randy Chastain <laughs> after, after scoring the goal about a, a, a about uh, Mac OS. I think that that's still to, to come. I think this was, they had to do this. This was the planning of the flag. I am very excited. We're going to take a break and come back and talk about iPad OS.
that's a seat change as well. And I think you, Renee, wrote I about it. I want to hear Andy's bit. reaction to the New York Times, the, sorry, the new New York font. We got San Francisco and New York now. Ooh, <laughs> New York is back, Ooh. baby. Can, it's a serif. Oh can Geneva goodness. be far behind? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, of course, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about other, uh, you know, additions uh, in iOS 13 and uh, Mac mm -hmm. OS. Did they say the name Catalina? But did, is it going to be Mac OS 10.15? I guess it is. It is. 10. Internally, it's 10.15. Okay. Yeah. And also, I, we uh, some Swift UI because I know Leo's going to start coding in it. The minute he has a I chance. cannot wait <laughs> to get my hands on Swift UI. In fact, honestly, this will be probably the first time in a couple of years that I'll I'll do the public beta on both Mac OS and iOS because they actually gave us a briefing with Josh who created Swift UI, which was really fun to watch. Right, we're going to talk about all of that in just yeah. a second. Lori Gill is here. She of the purple hair. You know, did you dye <laughs> your hair to match the Mac Break Weekly color? Because now. You go right, yes, you go just with that lower third so beautifully and our purple lights behind us. You just fit yep. right in. Thank you, it's, Lori. It, that's exactly what this was about. It's in celebration of my my um, joining the team. Yes, and I should say you are officially now a member of the team, so much so that you will be invited to the Christmas party. Yes, and I will come as long as there's not already something happening. I will be there. Carefully, so she's you're supposed to just drive there. Plan. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to mail out a save the date for crying out loud. Yeah. She's a busy yeah. person. Yeah. All right. Have you, have, well, have you got, sent her her, her, her to play. <laughs> You gotta make sure she gets her ceremonial toque and saber now that she's officially yes. a member She'll of the probably panel. Probably get a fez at least. It's a fez, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Anako, Chicago. Oh, I'm sorry. Boston Public Radio. <laughs> formerly, sort of. Formerly oh, Boston. now a Boston Public Radio. And you are in a different library, Carol. Did you take over the whole library, the reading room here? Gorgeous. No, this is an even better like conference room that you can <laughs> you can reserve on a website and stuff. Gosh. It's like I, I I'm still I, I promise you I will get to get getting my internet stuff like no. sorted. It's just that there's, Don't. there's so like, yeah, exactly. There there's so <laughs> many really good like because I'm now in quote like a downtown part of town, it's like it's kind of like now soothing that I can still I, I, there's a, I can work 8 to 10 hours a day but then when I get home it's like no 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 this is a place where you listen to music that's on your device you're going to read a paper book you're going to wow. it's like it's kind of I'm, I'm I, I will again I will get on that but it's like I kind of like having to get dressed up and go to work in the morning <laughs> and, but still have to and again these uh, it's I don't have to clean my office because the libraries keep their <laughs> rooms very clean look we've got ship models <laughs> i don't yeah. have ship models in my house <laughs> this is so awesome this is so beautiful please don't so this go might, home this, don't ever I, go I home might, exactly if, if if anything i'm gonna like just basically take a picture of this and if at worst worst comes to worst is use, yeah. use this as a background plate in my office from now on yeah, yeah. <laughs> and renee ritchie from my more also back from wwdc and he's ex ex accepting the top offers for his black on black WWDC jacket. <laughs> the reserve bid is $5,000. I, I need a Mac Pro. I got a Exactly. Let's set it to the Mac Pro price $6,000. <laughs> you know, I, I looked back because I had bought the iMac Pro when it came out, and that was an eye watering $5,000 start yeah. price. But I think, and I can blame you, Renee, because you said, oh, no, no, well, the one you want is 10 cores. <laughs> yeah. So I looked back <laughs> and it was seven thousand one hundred ninety nine dollars. So yeah, I'm not going to buy the this. One you wanted. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to buy the Isn't Mac it? Pro, but but yeah. I love the iMac Pro. And if Marco even said that, I don't know if he's going to buy a Mac Pro, yeah. but he could afford it. Anyway. Isn't it amazing? We're talking about like six thousand dollar computers, and that's with like the cloth interior and the factory stereo. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right. Well, but, there was someone I forget who someone went and did the price of all the Macs over time, and like some of them were like exactly. fourteen, like even like rinky dinky ones were like fourteen thousand dollars. I have a two FX motherboard hanging yes. in a nice frame. That thing FX stand for freaking expensive was uh, <laughs> to, I think close to ten thousand dollars when it yeah. came out. So yeah. this is nothing. This isn't really anything new. The twenty five hundred dollars I spent. For my very first Mac, the original 128K Mac, in in you know back in 1984, and in, in today's dollars, probably is close to five or six thousand dollars. These things were yeah. have always been expensive, but they've always also been, and this is why I'm I'm so grateful to Apple, the best you can get. And I think that's what yeah. Apple has done again is that this is the best computer, best micro computer you can get. It's a yeah. it's a for crying out loud, it's a it's a cray. It's a supercomputer. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. And it looks good, too. 
Our Joe sh- could use some of those RGB LEDs around the fan. Like really cool <laughs> I'm so PCs. glad they don't do that. Oh, man, I hate that <laughs> just, stuff. Just class it up. Just, you know, class, class it, up. it up. I bought a gaming PC for Michael, our 16-year-old. And, man, the thing, it's so silly. It looks like a UFO <laughs> landed on his desk. You know, it's so silly. <laughs> it's perfect for Pride Month, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the colors. Yeah, it's very much rainbow. Uh, our show today brought to you by ExpressVPN. Whatever kind of computer you're using or phone or mobile device, you should be using a VPN whenever you're out in public at those open Wi-Fi access points. You are vulnerable. Even at home, you're being snooped on by your internet service provider or your carrier. You need a, a virtual private network. Something encrypts all your traffic, keeps the snoops out, protects you from getting hacked, makes everything private, and that's... So that's a VPN. I think everybody here knows about VPNs. But often the question, uh, which VPN should I get? Sometimes people say, well, I can run my own VPN. But that's not going to give you the same benefit because, first of all, your own VPN is coming out of your house. So your ISP will now see what you're doing. And uh, it's hard to run a VPN. And bandwidth is an issue. You don't have that much upstream bandwidth. ExpressVPN has a lot of bandwidth. And it has servers all over the world. So you can emerge into the public internet completely privately. Your IP address is obfuscated. Your browsing is anonymized. And you can be anywhere in the world. So there's no more geographic restrictions. Plus, ExpressVPN is as easy as can be. They've got apps for every platform. You have one button click that turns the VPN on. And when you're ready to turn it off, turns it off. And, and this is why ExpressVPN is not free. They've got a lot of bandwidth. A lot of servers and a lot of bandwidth means you can use a VPN without suffering. It's fast, but it's safe, and it's private. And it is, after all, not that expensive, less than $7 a month. And and I think that's a very good deal for a, so a VPN service that does not log, does not keep track of you, anonymizes everything, and is fast and easy to use. This is why you want ExpressVPN. And by the way, if it doesn't meet your needs... They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you, there's no risk at all. Protect your online activity today. Use the VPN I use, the one that was rated number one on Tech Radar. And if you use our special address, not only will you be telling them you heard it here, which is very helpful for us, you'll be getting three extra months free with your one-year package. That's the best deal. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. ExpressVPN, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, VPN.com. Slash Mac break for three extra months free with a one year package and 30 day money back guarantee. ExpressVPN.com slash Mac break. We're, I'm very happy with ExpressVPN. You don't need maybe necessarily need it all the time, but when you need it, it's so good to have it. Andy Anako, Renee Ritchie, Lori Gill. There is so much to talk about uh, today. Apple laid so much on us. And of course, it wasn't all in the keynote. In fact, that's why I'm going to count on you, Lori. And and you, Renee, to supplement because there was a lot more announced about iOS 13 and uh, uh, Mac OS Catalina. Public uh, betas for both are next month? That's all we know, next month. Have yeah. you, either of you, started using the developer uh, edition? Of course. You are <laughs> on both. Oh, yeah. Now, we, oh, yeah. I just talked to Rosemary Orchard, uh, and she said it's, uh, iOS 13 is back to it's a little bit. Uh, unstable. She said, I would not necessarily recommend it on a production machine. Would you agree? I, Absolutely. for the first year, I didn't put it on my primary stuff because I saw like people who would know going through the hall, just, just yeah. shaking their heads. Yeah. Just, <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> Do you think it'll be better? Um, if the, in the public beta, like it'll be more, yes, it's, it's only a month yes. off, but I Deliberately guess. Deliberately so. Okay. Because I yeah. really want to do this stuff. There's so much I want to try. Uh, yeah, Rosemary was so is, is the expert, of course, on Mac shortcuts. And uh, yeah. it sounds like iOS 13 will have a lot of really beef up shortcuts by giving you uh, the shortcut creator direct access to a lot of, uh, of the sensors and so forth on iOS. That's going to be a big difference. And it's conversational, so it can take parameters, which everyone was yelling hallelujah for right after they said it. So tell me about that. So it, uh, so shortcuts, you can't have parameters in the shortcut? The original ones, like you would just tell it what to do, but it couldn't ask you questions back. Ah. In the new version, you could say, for example, uh, order order dinner from Pizza Queen, and it'll say, which of your last four orders do you want? The pepperoni, the Hawaiian, and you tell it, and it goes off and does it. Yeah. yeah, any good scripting language will have uh, commands to say, okay, now find out, <laughs> follow up here. And so now it can do that. That's a big deal. 
And two other really cool things, SiriKit has got support for maps now so that anything you could do, as long as the developers add support, you can use Waze or you can use Google Maps the same way you use Apple Maps with Siri. And even bigger is music, so uh, audio, so Overcast, Audible, um, Spotify, if they bother to put it in, you'll be able to use Siri to control all of that. And they did it really smart because one of the biggest problems was catalogs. Apple brute forced the entire Apple Music catalog, and they're still doing that with all the meta metadata, everything, and it's laborious. And you know, developers may or may not do that, but what they're going to do is pre-cache any frequent or recent items that you've been playing and suck those in so that those are ready for you right away. And then if it has to do more complicated lookups, it'll do those later. Let, uh, oh, there's so much to talk about. Um, I know. Marzipan is no longer uh, a delicious almond treat. It's Catalyst, <laughs> Project Catalyst. Uh, but some of the same features, that's going to be, uh, I think, a sea change as well. It makes developers, yeah. by the way, with no extra effort, it seems like, be able to yes. make uh, yeah. their iOS apps into Mac OS apps. Yes, Lori? Yeah, talking to developers at WFDC, that was one of the biggest exciting things that was coming from them was how easy it's going to be for them to port their iPad apps to Mac without having to do anything, just flip a switch, maybe do a little bit of tweaking so that it makes sense on Mac, but that's it. A Apple did the work so that developers don't have to. It's It sounds really great for develop from the developer's side. From a user's side, of course it's really great because we're going to have our favorite apps on, on Mac, but from the developer's point of view, they can finally have Mac apps and they don't have to spend a lot of time starting from scratch, building a new app. It's just right there, just tick a box. Really huge. Uh, you could tick a box for all the different Mac platforms. iPhone, iPad, and Mac. And the one thing that was nice, was, I, I really like to hear is that Craig totally mea culpa on last year's um, yeah. Catalyst Marzipan apps. He's like, we those those weren't an example of technology. We let everyone make their own design choices because we were experimenting with it. And some of them worked out worse than others. But when you look at like podcasts and you put it next to, podcasts is a Catalyst app, music is a NapKit app, and you put them next to each other and they're, they're pretty much indistinguishable. You can't tell them apart. And I think that shows... There was some fear that it would be a bunch of really crappy iPad apps grafted on the Mac. Yes. But my thinking is there's a bunch of developers who really love, they're proud of their apps, and they just didn't have the bandwidth or the resources or the time to learn AppKit, and so they didn't make a Mac app. But now that they can have Xcode give them a Mac app and they can spend their time polishing it, like choosing vibrancy for the sidebar or tweaking the menu or the command keys, they're happy to do all that. They just didn't have to learn AppKit to do it. Yeah, and we'll see all exactly. of those apps come over. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and also, and also, maybe when Apple decides to make a touchscreen Mac, it means that they won't mm, have to reinvent everything. Maybe. Yeah. Speaking they of didn't touch even make sidecar touchscreen. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, they didn't make sidecar touchscreen, but you can use your Apple Pencil on yeah. your iPad with your Mac apps, and that's pretty impressive. Yeah. No, that's it's when I when I when I refer when I refer people back to the fact that I've been talking when the Touch Bar came out, say, well, what if I have an iPhone, I have an iPad, why don't you let developers put part of the user interface on this expensive, really wonderful device that I already have? I'm not bragging that. Wow, I foresaw this. I'm I'm making I'm making a point about how obvious an idea this was that even a numbskull like me could have. <laughs> made the suggestion like two or three years ago. That's something that I'm really excited about. They even they it's it's weird. They they're even uh, uh you know the, the one of the coolest little features of the the preview app has always been the ability to sign documents, uh, PDF documents like within the app. And now they and you and you could either like take a picture of your signature or you could like do with your fingertip do a signature on the touchpad. Now they will even just let you do it on the phone or on the iPad. Just here's when when it's time to. To sign something it will like light up your ipad or your iphone and mm -hmm. say okay here's a signature area for it like that means it's nice to know that these that the boys and girls on the ipad side and the boys and ios side and the boys and girls who live on the mac os side they're talking again it's like they're, <laughs> da I, I, they're, they're it's like they've been having like friday night dances and they're finally like learning that wow these people are not freaks we like them let's work together actually that's After really good years. news because this goes back a little ways, but when Sal Segoyan uh, departed or was forced to depart Apple, of course, the king of Automator and uh, Apple Script. Um, the I saw him. He said hello, Leo. Oh, nice. I love he Sal. He was there. He said to say hello, Leo. I'm so yeah, glad. So the general gist of it seemed to be that Apple had automation and iOS had automation. And the automation guys at iOS 
either didn't care about or disrespected they whatever it was that they they're now the new headquarters of automation and and you got that feeling throughout that there was ios and there was mac os and you know it's kind of a battle and this has killed microsoft in the in the 90s it was a really yeah. bad problem at microsoft so it's very gratifying to see this kind of uh, synergy that maybe it means one team won maybe it means they buried the hatchet but for whatever reason you want apple to be operating as a single unified whole yeah. not as different bat you know different little fiefdoms lock-in is not a problem so long as it's a feature for the user and this is yeah. helping lock-in to be a feature yeah. for the user to make add more value to your ipad and your iphone and your mac yeah and while we do talk you know we're, we're kind of today anyway we've been talking about the uh, creators the content creators the developers features for them all of this benefits the end user yeah. in the long run happy developers yeah. mean happy happy end users more apps more choice better apps uh, I think Swift UI is going to be a very interesting feature. This is a, a, a way that Xcode's always had a interface designer that you could then hook up uh, code into, but this makes it much easier to do it and to do it in mm -hmm. Swift, a modern language, and so easy that I think you're going to see a lot of new people and especially young people developing for Mac OS. That's really interesting. Oh, I don't know if this would make a difference, Leo, but the uh, the Siri shortcuts team has been like all of that stuff has been moved under John Gene Andrea, so that's all part that's of the new AI why. Yeah. division. And yeah. like the Mac automation gets okay. its own. Oh, it's so much Siri. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, so the the Mac uh, automation that's still going to be Mac automation. They're going to get to do all the scripting and and all the other stuff that really doesn't make sense. Uh, in an ios -y sort of, or at least the current ios -y world. Uh, and the Shortcuts team is really working with Siri to sort of, I think one day this will be the way you make Siri apps, like with voice control and with Siri Shortcuts, and you'll just tell the, the system what you want to be an app, and it'll go, boom, there's your new app. Uh, but it's going to yeah. take a while to get there, and them all working together is a good way to do that. Yeah. Siri UI, is, it's going to be one, of, I think it's a positive form of divisiveness where it's a real bummer for everybody who has been working on apps for years and years and years and I years know. and they know what and they they know what they're doing they yeah. know how ui kit works they know how the, they're they're they, they're comfortable in objective c they're composed in what they're doing whereas the people who are starting right now who like renee say might be inspired to go from users to creators of apps uh, they are getting some of the most powerful and really kind of mind expanding tools for writing apps for multiple platforms so that's so i i, I kind of it's I, I don't like the fact that uh, older developers are feeling kind of minus that they're going to have to basically start not completely anew, but they're going to have to spend a lot of their time and mental bandwidth learning this new system if they want to get the full benefits of writing apps for any of these platforms. But I'm glad to see that it will help all users everywhere. I'm also the more that I look into Swift UI, the more I'm wondering if part of the part of the plan for Swift UI and why it's so important at, at Apple is that. Let's say that you wanted to. Let's say that you wanted to once again for the third time in Apple history switch to a whole other processor architecture for the Mac. You would kind of want to, and if you could, you, and you didn't want to do like an emulation layer like you did the previous couple of times uh, to help people along. Maybe you would try to, in addition to all the other reasons why you would might want to get a new like sort of UI kit. You could basically teach all of these programmers and developers developers to create a grand a brand new uh, category of apps that in two or three years time when an arm based mac comes on the market will just automatically work on arm because all they have to do is recompile these things because they're working on brand new apis and because you have new versions of the operating system they're going to require use of swift ui and uh, use of new toolkits i think that this is much more this is a much much bigger and broader plan than simply uh, modernizing uh, Mac app UI development. If, uh, so I don't know if there's a plan, but there's like there's a there, there's a thing that happens at Apple where a bunch of a confluence of smart technologies comes together and looks like a master plan sometimes. <laughs> and like for Swift UI, Josh was running the watch team and they needed to make native apps, but UI kit was still problematic. So he started making Swift UI as a way for developers to make native watch apps. And then Craig saw it and said, no, no, we we want this everywhere. Like everyone should be able to make <laughs> apps like this. And so Josh moved when Josh moved back to UI kit, he took it with them and they started just putting it together. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you can write this stuff and it doesn't really matter 
what's underneath it. Like it'll do you app kit when it has to, it'll do you I kit when it has to, it'll do whatever anything else coming in the future will do. And even something like dark mode, they didn't just make a dark mode, they created semantic uh, dynamic colors. So for example, instead of like this being RGB 000 and this being RGB 255, 255, 255, it's background color and it's background color and it's UI blue and it's label and all of those stuff can move around so that again, it's like another abstraction layer. Developers can tell it what they want to do and the system can figure out the optimal way to do it. And to Andy's point, as those systems start to change, the developer no longer has to go back and change all the hardwired code because the code is aware enough to know what its new capabilities are, which is really, really cool when you think about a, a future a future forwards operating system. Yeah. It's, it's the uh, Swift UI uh, uh, track from WWDC is up. You can watch uh, the video. And if you're a developer, to watch this code come alive in the emulator immediately to the right and to see how uh, fast and easy it is to do this in Swift, how powerful it is, uh, is is really exciting. And I, I feel like this is this is going to be a... And again, it's so legible. Yeah. 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 It's going to be a great opportunity for developers, but that means great software for end users. Yeah. It's, it's and a bunch of the next guys were like super, I didn't think they'd be excited about it because there was some pushback on Swift, but the Swift UI stuff, they're like, you know, I've been, this is something we tried to do it next. We were never yeah. able to do, and I'm yeah. so happy. Uh, and uh, Gruber had a good point too. It was like when they just typed in the word blue, the whole front of the room was like, mm -hmm. yeah, it turned blue because he typed blue. And the whole back of the room just exploded. Like, yeah. oh my God, all he did was type blue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a live preview and you can watch the code execute uh, on a running program as it's running uh this is and kind for, of the for modern someone like some me of that, that doesn't UI know anything too. for someone like that, me that doesn't know anything about developing like I'd, i've never learned code or anything and i look at that and it seems it makes sense it oh, yeah it doesn't look like a different language to me it no. looks like a language that i could learn yeah. not yeah. something that i'm so intimidated by so yeah. it's even exciting for people like me who's never really been interested in coding before, it kind of makes me want to go, you know, yeah. learn some coding. <laughs> Good. No, me, that's me, the idea. Me too. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of like work, I went from like C plus plus to Apple script really, because by the time I, I never really got into C plus plus as a creative endeavor, it was always very, very technical. Whereas I always even 65 to assembler language, I thought was very, very a creative way of creating programs. And I didn't really get uh, renew my love for creating software until I got into Apple script until I uh, uh, got back into Python. Uh, Swift is kind of getting uh, kind of getting into my heart a little bit because mm -hmm. it is sort of, oh, God, do I really have to? Do I really have? You're not going to you're not going to let me access memory directly, but you're going to annoy the heck out of me every time I tell you that every time I dereference a pointer incorrectly by a way that you've decided to make up on your own right now. You're not making this fun for me, compiler. <laughs> so yeah, this is getting this is getting me back into programming if too. If I it's want a, null really pointers, I should get null pointers. So there, yes, it works. <laughs> Just let it run. It works. Where's okay? my garbage collection? Where's my Java? Uh, I'm sorry, but I believe I believe that you want this to be. A long int instead of an integer, and so <laughs> for that reason, I'm going to have to like flag this for shut up. Shut up. It's a tip calculator. <laughs> By the way, was it as noisy in the room when they mentioned the tip calculator on the watch as it was at home? You couldn't. Yes, you couldn't except, even hear yeah. what anybody was saying. It's like yeah. that was the highlight of the uh, of the keynote. <laughs> <laughs> that dark mode, and there was a couple that people just lost their mind. Also, there was apprehension. When you saw that first hint of the Mac Pro and it looked round, it's like everyone just gasped for a second. Yes, I think yeah. they did that on purpose in like the video. Oh, yes. Absolutely. That was, that was, they punked us. It was mean. I had that reaction. I went, oh. Oh. And what they what they what they should have done is they should have had like Jamie they, they should have had like uh, uh, like Adam Savage like build a potato gun that could fire the old <laughs> round Mac Pro like into a brick wall and that's that would have gotten the biggest applause. You know, okay, they got it. They understand that they need to start again. <laughs> here's the uh, just in case you didn't see it. Here's the 45 second uh, intro video. And right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how. In fact, no, I think the that's sun, how they the introduced setting. I think that's how they introduced the uh, the trash can Mac. Was that very? Yep. <laughs> and I'm looking at this, going, "Oh crap! It's round. Yep. <laughs> oh yep. no! It looks just like the trash can like, Mac." Are they oh. showing us the wheels? They're showing us the holes. Like, what, what I think those are the holes, but. I, 
but then I mean that's the trash can. Wait a minute, maybe it is the trash can. It, yeah, that well, was I think I think Lori's right. I think that might be the wheel. <laughs> it says the 2019 Mac Pro concept no. video. Oh, this is somebody else's. Oh, no, this is the wrong oh, okay. oh I had yeah. the wrong yeah. one. God, no wonder it looks so much like that. <laughs> <sighs> That scared yeah, the hell out of me. I, think they were tro- I will, they I will show that, it again. Maybe it's this horizon. one. No, that's 2013. They showed that horizon at the beginning. Yeah, they did. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, they did this. It so re- that proves it because that was made out of the Trash Can Mac intro. So let me see if I can find. Um, it was, no, yeah. It was, yeah. 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 Anyway, if you watch it, you'll go, well, I, I've seen that before. Oh, no. Then they never showed the Johnny it. Ive. This is the Johnny Ive one. They never showed the Johnny Ive one, yeah. which kind of surprised me. Um, I had hit Johnny Ive's video on my bingo card, so I was a little disappointed. <laughs> um, anyway, it's just... He and Phil and Dan were all in the hands-on area because a lot of people were concerned they didn't see them, but they were all in the they hands-on They were all there. area. Okay, good. Yeah. What, uh, let's talk about... Uh, let's take a break and then talk about uh, I- iPad OS because I think that that also is a really good example of Apple listening to me. But because uh, <laughs> how many times have people said, oh, this, this new iPad Pro is the best hardware ever running ancient antiquated software? Well, now it has its very own version of iOS. But first, a word from our sponsor, the folks at LastPass. Actually, the number one app I put on my iOS devices or my Android devices or my Mac devices or my Windows devices. In fact, when I set up a new device, pretty much the first thing I install is LastPass. LastPass is a password manager, a vault where you can store all your passwords and not have to remember them. If you're tired of setting, remembering, and forgetting passwords, let LastPass take away all the stress with password management. Just one password, your master password, and LastPass will generate and remember the rest. And you do want to let LastPass generate long, strong passwords. In fact, LastPass has a security uh, uh, assay that I went through the other day after Flipboard got compromised. I thought, oh, I'm in trouble because I use that Flipboard password everywhere. So all I did is I go into LastPass. I run the security check. It comes up with passwords that I've used multiple times, passwords that are weak, passwords I haven't changed in a while. And in most cases, we'll automatically change those passwords in seconds for me. And the ones that I have to do by hand, it'll walk you through the process. It makes it easy to create a unique, strong password for every account. And since there are so many breaches these days, that is a worthwhile effort, a worthwhile endeavor. And then once your passwords are in LastPass, it auto-fills it. So even on iOS and Android. So when you install an app, if I put Snapchat on my new iPhone, I have to just press a button and LastPass fills it in, logs me in, and I'm set. LastPass is more secure, safer. Frankly, it's the only way to manage passwords. I mean, if you're not using LastPass, run. Don't walk to lastpass.com slash twit lastpass.com slash twit there's a last pass for everybody last pass premium for individuals at home we use last pass families because i have a shared folder that everybody in the family well lisa gets and uh, that way she can you know if i set up a new account with a cable provider or the utility company she gets that password automatically if i change it it changes automatically uh, she also has emergency access to my last pass vault this is a very nice feature you absolutely should set up to designate somebody should something happen to you if you die or become disabled so that they have your passwords, so that they can settle your estate, so they can close your Facebook account, all of that stuff. Uh, I, I highly recommend LastPass for that reason alone. Then there's also LastPass Teams for small businesses, 50 or fewer, and LastPass Enterprise. That's what we've been using at Twit for many years now. 100-plus customizable policies in the Enterprise version to give you flexibility and control when it comes to managing access in your organization. For instance, we have us, we have a minimum requirements for the master password, minimum length, number of digits, and so forth. We also require two-factor, and LastPass supports every form of two-factor. Uh, I use a YubiKey, but it also supports Duo, uh, and of course, all the uh, various authenticator programs. It is really a nice thing to do. We, inf we require two-factor here at Twit. But we also give every one of our employees their own copy of LastPass because I think that that's a benefit everybody should have. We benefit and they benefit. And as an admin, you get all sorts of great reports. You can track changes over time. You can improve security, check trends, and revoke passwords or reset passwords. I get the uh, email. 
because I'm one of the administrators. I always know when one of you guys forgets your passwords. <laughs> Never happens to you, John. Good job. <laughs> With seamless background sync, offline access, and an app for almost every device, you always have your passwords, and only you have your passwords, because LastPass only decrypts at device level. They don't have access. You don't have access. I mean, you do. They don't. <laughs> you, you have access. They don't. And the hackers don't. Join over 13.5 million people who have signed up and trusted. I've been using it for a decade. We've been using it Twit for several years. I even ran it by Steve Gibson. He interviewed the creator of LastPass, Joe Segrist. Joe showed him everything it's doing, all the things it's doing smart and well, and, and that's what Steve uses. That's a pretty good recommendation. LastPass.com slash Twit. Thank you, LastPass, for your support of Twit all these years. And uh, we thank you for supporting MacBreak Weekly by using that special address, lastpass.com slash twit. Can I tell you a cool new password feature for iOS 13 that would work well with this, Leo? What? So, you know, sign on with Apple, the new single sign on they're doing? Yes. So they're making it so that it can, can shoot you fat. Like, let's say you download a new game. You just want to get in and play. A developer doesn't care about your stuff. You just hit that button. It creates you an account, and you're in. But sometimes people forget that they already have an account. So in that case, Apple is going to check with the database, and they have both the keychain and they have the extension for password managers. And it will show you that you already have an account. Oh, hallelujah. You in. Yeah. Hallelujah. So you don't create multiple accounts by accident. I do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, well, this time, you could take the last pass, Lord, through down. This time I, uh, 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 was my own fault. I set up If This Then That years ago, and I turned on two-factor. But then, for some reason, I erased the two-factor from my authenticator. I don't know why. So now I have a rogue If This Then That <laughs> account that is doing stuff on my behalf, yes. and I can't stop it. <laughs> so be careful, folks. Do not create yes. multiple accounts. Uh, this will try to save you from yourself. <laughs> Holy cow. I don't... Uh, so, for instance, and this was a weird experience, I, I have Why Things uh, uh, blood pressure monitor and scale. And um, I hadn't... I had... I had in, in 10 years ago, I created a Twitter account called Leo's Scale. And I had set it up with If This and That, that it would tweet my weight and my blood pressure. Hadn't done that in, since 2015. <laughs> All of a sudden, I got a new scale, a new blood pressure monitor, and I tied it into my Why Things account, and all of a sudden, it's tweeting again. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't stop it. God, the if robots the, are taking over. If this, then that says you have to call us if you have an account you want to decommission and you can't log into it. So I've, I now have to call If This, Then That and say, can you please turn that off? I don't know what else it's doing. It's doing other things, too. It's, it is. It's like a little account. bot that's got out of my control. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just a living. Well, yeah. It's it's its own living entity it's, now that because it is. you can't get to it. It's a I very interesting yeah. experience. You can actually, with mm. this and that, create a creature that responds to in stimulus and then lose control of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so creepy. <laughs> I know. Well, imagine my surprise when uh, I was I came into work and Kim Schaffer says, "Oh, nice uh, nice blood pressure." <laughs> what? How did you know? Well, you tweeted it. Oh, no, I did not. <laughs> so back to iPad OS. iPad OS uh, coming in iOS 13. Is that the right way to say it? Or should we say a brand new OS coming in in the fall? Depends on no how idea. you want to market it. <laughs> it's so iOS, right? The thing. Yes. It's, it's based, it is based on iOS 13, but it is given its own destination because what Apple did with with this um, software is bigger than just adding a few features. So to call it iOS 13 with iPad features is really doing this the software update a disservice because it really is a major change from just iOS 13. And I think that the for marketing purposes it's IO it's iPad OS, but in, it really is like there's so many things that you get to do on an iPad that are like significant and wonderful and amazing that if they would have just called it iOS 13 with a couple new features, you wouldn't have realized just how amazing it is. Well, and I think uh, I'm going to even read more into it. I think it is the beginning of the differentiation of the iPad from the iPhone. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a promise that every know. year they have to show up and announce new features, just like they have to with Watch. You can't just go, ah, oh, sorry, Tim has a slide saying iPad US, but we have nothing 
iPad OS. We have nothing they, to say this year. They should have done this. Uh, well, um, I shouldn't say that because I. But I'm glad they did it because it does. It makes this a distinct, this iPad a distinct creature, that because it really does deserve. For instance, the home screen. For having the iPhone home screen on there, it left all this real estate, these big spaced out icons. It, I'm, it's very OCD of me, but I yeah. found that extremely annoying. Well, there's there's a lot of little stuff. That just the fact that we can get now that now uh, iPad will have its own version of Safari that is treated yes. not yeah. like not as a mobile browser but as like a desktop browser. Given that now they really uh, not only are they marketing the iPad as a true like productivity based uh, alternative to a laptop or at least excuse me uh, not not something that can do the, the same work as a laptop but the same thing the same jobs as a laptop only better uh, they're doing this for real uh, they're making they're really putting their money where their mouth is but just simply saying there is iPad OS and then there is iOS uh, and th 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 really sells the idea to people who are considering that it gives them that extra little uh, psychological push that says, "Oh, this is not just the same operating system yeah. that is running on my phone." I wonder how long iOS will not will remain iOS instead of iPhone OS, though. It used to be iPhone OS, right? Until I yeah. until iOS four. Oh, <laughs> how ironic! I forgot about that. So yeah. we're going to be able to put some widgets on the home screen. I think that will be a big improvement uh, coming from Android. That's one of the features I most like yeah. about Android. Right after Update. HTC announces that almost nobody uses widgets, Apple deploys them. Apple, no, HTC announces <laughs> no one uses widgets. Apple kills dashboard uh, and then adds widgets to the iPad home screen. Yeah, but, yeah no more dashboard. What? That's yeah. wild. Yeah. Yeah. Finally. They um, went to the iPad home screen. <laughs> they, I'm a little concerned about the gestures because one of the things that killed Windows 8 was a lot of undiscoverable affordances, weird places to move the mouse and gestures that nobody, you know, nobody reads the manual. Nobody could figure out. Nobody could remember. iOS is starting to get a lot of these. And now these new gestures for cut and copy and undo, uh, three finger gestures, I guess, what what are you going to do with it? something like iOS? There's a iPad. greater philosophy. So what I, I got a chance to talk to Sarah Herlinger, who runs accessibility at Apple. Um, and they what they wanted to do was sort of abstract away the, 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 the controlling mechanism from the iPad. So, for example, their philosophy was you should be able to do everything with multi-touch, everything with the keyboard, and everything with a mouse or assistive How touch. How windowsy of them. That's so yeah. funny because in the early days of the <laughs> but, Macintosh, they very clearly said, no, you have to use the mouse. You cannot use a keyboard yes. to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's 10 years later. It's like, honestly, it should have been five years later that they yeah. started doing that because we yeah. learned multi-touch by then. Yeah. But these gestures, basically anything you can drag, you can drop into a new window. The three finger thing is going to be problematic. For example, for people who just can't control three fingers on the same hand, but they have it the keyboard. It was problematic for it. the guy doing the demo on stage. <laughs> <laughs> he kept saying, oops, no, um, oop, ah, sorry. <laughs> My biggest problem now is these, you still can't tell what window you're in, unless I'm mistaken, Lori, but you still can't tell what window oh, you're in. So no I'm label. copying and pasting in the wrong window yeah. sometimes because there's no a active, like it doesn't change the color yeah, of the window. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. I have that problem well, all know, the time. This is, remember, this is... This is Dev Beta One, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, make sure that we are clarifying that this isn't the permanent way it's going to be. Maybe they'll make some changes by the time it comes out. Well, and they did reassure me by get, adding a huge number of keyboard uh, commands. Yeah, right? so, so you're supposed to be able to control it with your keyboard too. I, I don't have to take my fingers off the keyboard, and I think actually yeah. I love a touch screen, but I don't want to have to take my fingers off the yes. keyboard. And mm. switching and a, modes like that is problematic. Yeah, yeah, we we had that discussion about once your iPad is connected to a keyboard, your brain says, I don't want to touch the screen anymore, right. but you still end up having to touch the screen. Right. And the way iPad OS is coming around, and even with the accessibility um, pointing devices, which allows you to have a mouse or a trackpad connected, I don't want to call it mouse support or trackpad support. I haven't actually tried it yet to see how robust the mouse support is, but it's called pointing devices, which allows you to have like a more yeah. uh, detailed pointer. So with pointing device support and keyboard support and keyboard shortcuts, we are at that point now where we no longer have to reach up and touch the screen when we don't want to, if we're using our, our iPad in um, keyboard mode. It's It really does make a, a huge difference on kind of using it like you would use a computer. They did not mention this feature uh, on stage, but Renee, I know you went right to the no. demo room and looked 
and uh, yeah. we're able to found mouse support. So we've confirmed now that mouse support is trackpad support as well. I've been, yeah, so I've been using it and basically what it does is it puts a little crosshair on the screen okay. and you move that crosshair around and then you press the button and it hits, it literally taps whatever the, the crosshair is okay. on. Ah. And it is, does it have right click support? And again, no. in developer beta one, so remember No, because there's no so concept of a right click one, there's either. No. Yeah. Right, there's, that's, like that's what I thought wouldn't. that it's. So that's interesting. Is, yeah, that's why it's an accessibility and not as a general UI device. It's really about they, accessibility. They, there's there's no concept of a mouse in iOS, and instead of grafting that on, they took assistive touch, which has been built in there for years, right. and they expanded it to external pointing devices. And one of the things that that's cool is that it, 3D touch and long press were confusing because they would often collide. You'd, you'd get it wrong, and now they're just the same thing. So on an iPad now, Hallelujah. you can just press, and you get keyboard <laughs> shortcuts, or you, sorry, you get uh, home screen shortcuts. You get all the stuff that you yes. would get with 3D touch, which that like, was it makes your overdue. brain just think it works that way. Yeah, that yeah. was long overdue. Having various ways to do the same things is always a bad idea. Uh, in that in that respect, How, am I long pressing? Am I deep press? What am I doing here? And you couldn't yeah. put 3D Touch on the iPad because the screen was too big right. for the way they did it on the iPhone. It would yeah. interfere. But so now they just said, okay, whatever, long press is 3D Touch. Right. It's fine. Yeah. 3D Touch was a weird, it was a weird implementation. Of it's, it goes to show how difficult it is to have a feature that is not a basic UI feature that they can't implement on every single device. Right. Uh, so it, so that, that means that it's not going to be essential, which means that people are not going, even people who have a device that uh, works with 3D Touch, they're not going to instinctively do that. Well, what happens if I lo if I 3D touch on this thing? What happens then? And so it's easy to forget that this feature actually exists. And I feel this, and it's, and it's great for people who use it and people who think that way. Uh, and it doesn't get in the way of people who don't think that way. Uh, that's how I feel about all these like three finger gestures on iPad. But I feel as though that's not really a way of moving things forward. People are not going to think, "Hallelujah!" Now I can three. Now what happens if I 3D <laughs> drag on this uh, on this paragraph? I really do think that mouse and trackpad support is, I, I think, I, I hope it's not a dogmatic uh, omission from iPad OS at this point. I hope it's not something where they just say, no, 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 of course we can't. We wouldn't dare sully the iPad with something as trivial as an I, as a mouse support. We're going to do something much, much more bigger and more. No, you should just, it's, it works great. You plug a mouse in on even on an Android phone and it works great by just simply having a mouse pointer that you can click on things you would ordinarily tap on. You don't have to come up with this entire backstory. You don't have to come up with this uh, MCU universe idea of how this is going to fit in and broaden the thing just give us a pointer that shows up when you attach via bluetooth or via usb a pointing device and my goodness will i be so happy with my ipad pro well yeah, you got it. it happens with everything now <laughs> yeah and it's yeah. all of ios 13 so you can use it on your iphone too if you want to yeah yeah uh, um go ahead so uh, one thing uh, with 3d touch and and uh and long press uh, the the issue that i have had recently i've noticed is I will switch between devices that do and don't support it. And I press like really hard on a screen that doesn't support it on accident, <laughs> like looking for that 3D press. So my brain's going to be happy to like uh, navigate amongst all of my mobile devices and not accidentally try to trigger things that don't exist on those different like devices. Touch ID on iPod Touch, you just think it's broken and you sit there forever and it doesn't yep. unlock and you remember you have to press it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, iTunes is dead. Long live iTunes. Uh, no, this... It's not dead. It's just been split up. <laughs> so, yeah, that's OK. So finally, Apple has published. They just published today uh, at support.apple.com. Uh, note 210200. <laughs> and it's almost the kind of thing that, you know, your dad would uh, come up to you and say, um, about the upcoming changes. Well, you know, it's so it was so so <laughs> Mark Mark Gurman put out an article last week saying that Apple was going to deprecate iTunes for these new apps. The Los Angeles Times proceeded to quote to, to to reference him and say that they were killing the iTunes store and eliminating downloads. Yeah, yeah. And my mom called me, my friends oh, called me, oh everyone was in a panic <laughs> that Apple was going to come to their house and take away their downloads and their store. So they really that just ever ever happened they're just splitting it up into three apps music podcast yes. and tv music here's apple's a uh, note music you've imported or purchased will be in the apple music app logically music playlists smart playlists you created in itunes will be in the apple music app 
the iTunes Store will still be available to buy music on Mac, iOS, PC, and Apple TV. iTunes gift cards, iTunes credits will be maintained and can be used with the new apps in the App Store. iPhone, iPad, and iPod backup, restore, and syncing, this is a big one, will move to Finder. So it's now going to... I love this, that so much. This is the exact right yep. thing to do. It's now an operating system feature. It'll show up as they showed on stage in the menu bar. Good. So your backup it makes so is much sense there. there, Leo. It just yep. it makes so much sense for that stuff to be in Finder. Yes, movies and TV shows will be in the TV app. Yep. <laughs> Duh. Use the Apple TV app for Mac and future for Mac for future movie and TV purchases and rentals. Does that mean you can't use the TV app on iOS to purchase movies? And no, I'm sure you can. No, you right? still can. The, the big deal about this is we're we're quote unquote finally getting 4K HDR down uh, downloads and streams on uh, the Mac because this packages it all up the way Hollywood wants it packaged all right. up. Podcasts you subscribe to iTunes will be in the podcast app. Audiobooks will be in the updated Apple Books app. I think that's interesting. Use the Apple Books app for Mac for future audiobook purchases so in other words all the functions are still there this is something itunes much needed it was really overburdened with too many features they're just cleaning it up by moving the various forms yeah. of media into their own didn't you love that joke though when he completely lent into the any app uh, developer gets yes. enough time will never be an email app yes <laughs> yeah. which is absolutely you know true right nope, that's that, that we're that's adding an email old, old to joke. itunes it's a great yep. joke yeah Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That was a that was a nice moment. Um, so this is Renee. You've looked at this now, and Renee and Laura, yeah. you've both used it now. You feel good about it? Is it any issues you can see, Renee? Lori? I can't say it's, it's hard to talk about. It's hard to talk about this when it's developer beta, right? Yeah, because you don't know what's going to happen in the end. Right. But one thing that I I did notice that I. I'm not sure how this is going to work out, but the TV app right now, um, you can't on on Mac, um, you can't add apps to it. So you can't add your Hulu app to it. It's, there's no, there's nothing to add. Oh. So how are we going to access those things? Oh, they'll fix that. They when, have to. That's that's why again this is yeah. the developer beta, and I hate saying things because yeah. like we've got months for them to figure right. this out. Presumably, what will happen is that these um, companies will be able to develop, you know, using Swift, they'll be able to move their apps to Mac really easily. So then right. we'll download those apps on our Mac, and then they'll they'll just show up in the TV like they do right. on Apple TV. That makes sense. But at this moment, there there isn't that's that's not there. So but you'll still have a Netflix app and a Hulu app on Mac, so it's not like you're not gonna. It just won't be in the TV app. And we hope so. Netflix might go. Ah, we're or fine as a be. website. <laughs> yeah. it, but that, yeah, but that it, might, it but might that, be. Sorry, go ahead. It might be coming to the TV app. It's just right now right. because it's so early. It's really hard to tell what is how this is going to work. How this design user interface is going to work for us. Here's the screenshot for, of uh, syncing in Finder. It looks pretty much like the iTunes sync page, except yeah. instead yeah. of being in iTunes, it's showing up as part of your Finder window, uh, which is it's a location. Locations include your iPhone. And you, all the same thing. You can manage storage. You'll see all the div you know the different yeah. media types. This is actually a much cleaner interface. Um, makes so can, much more sense. You can back up. You can encrypt. All the yeah. things you could do before. This is this makes a lot of sense. People, yeah, every every time, uh, how many how many of us have had to go through that? With people who have their own their their first iPhone or their first oh, iPad. God. They're just they're just expecting. They plug it into the USB port. They're expecting to see it in the Finder somewhere. Even if <laughs> yeah, even that if little even if icon in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's like come on. Yeah, and it's like well, first of all, you're going to need the preview. The 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 image capture app is going to show you where the picture are and then this other app is going to show you where the music is crazy. and yeah no yeah no this is much better and by the way there is so there are all the tabs for the media types music movies tv shows podcasts audiobooks books photos files and info so there's plenty of yeah information in that window centralized in one spot i don't really laurie uh, maybe you watch tv on your mac a lot i don't know if i care that much about a tv app on the mac i do actually when i'm working i okay. have a little yep. window up in the background okay. so um n having the tv app come to mac is a big deal just because right now i go to netflix and i put uh, put up a screen and i 
you know, use the Pippa fire to have a little, uh, right. you know, window in window up in the corner, or I go to iTunes and I pull a movie. So having it all in one place just means easy. It's easier for me to just kind of jump into yeah. a TV or movie and just have it there. Cause again, it's, I don't fully watch it, but it's kind of my background noise. And so I love the idea of being able to jump in and out of all of my TV shows and movies all in one place. And also, it just makes sense if you don't have the Mac, if you don't have the TV app on the Mac, everybody's going to ask you where do I download the TV app on the Mac because <laughs> yeah. they're going to expect that yeah. they're not, they're not going to imagine that it's not simply available. How could you not have a TV app? Um, let's see. There's so much to talk about. I'm just kind of picking and choosing at uh, random little uh, tidbits. We didn't talk too much about the ability to on an iPad Pro to use the USB C port as a storage. We did mention that you yeah. can do yep. camera connect. It's gonna very much streamline the photographer's workflow. You go right into Lightroom now. Jeez. <laughs> SM, and, the, and the ability to, to to connect to SMB directly from the files app. Isn't that that's amazing? Like the, that, yeah. That's like the that's they've they've isolated what has always been for me the hugest pain point of using an iPad Pro as a primary device when I'm outside the office. And that's and the the, the files app originally was a very good first step to that. But the ability to again, here is a arbitrary USB key that has files on it. And I just want to get the electrons from here onto there. There's nothing more frustrating than knowing that. But the files are right here. <laughs> if I can just plug this into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it'd be good. Else, else, Will you be able to back up to an external USB device in some way? Uh, the backup know. system can't target it yet. Okay. So that could be a possible for the future. But it can't. Okay. Also, it's they, they've done a lot for security. Like, obviously, it doesn't run Windows executables or even Mac executables. But just in general, they did a lot so that you don't have to worry about uh, juice jacking or arbitrary malware oh, on oh, the good. stick. Oh, you good. plug in your files. They've tried to keep it as secure as iOS is nice. secure. Nice. And, and I got I to gotta tell you, with, uh, with uh, screen support built into Catalina, the idea of buying an iPad Pro specifically as an external display for uh, for a Mac Mini is super hot. That's oh, yeah. such, I've been, a, that's I've been such doing a that cool with Duet idea. for a long time, and then uh, what's yep. what, do you, what do you got there, Laurie? Is that your? This is this is on um, this is Sidecar on iPad nice. Mini, and I'm telling you, it's adorable. Yep. I know it's it's very pointless on an iPad it's Mini, so but small. I just love running it but just because it's so cute. No, no, but just. But, it was, but it just just like you said with the with the Apple TV, just being able to have the Apple TV app and basically send it to the iPad screen, just the ability to have to have uh, use of it as a uh, as a graphics tablet with your Apple Pencil, on and on and on and on. That is the one. That's single handedly they have made the Mac a lot cooler and the iPad a lot cooler. And now again, lock in is not a problem so long as you give the user so many benefits for having bought all of your hardware from the same company. Yeah. It's amazing. There I was do. a guy walking around McHenry with a with a with a uh, trash can Mac Pro using the iPad as a display. He would just <laughs> pop it down in the labs, pull out his iPad, and say, "Can you help me with this?" That's <laughs> and everyone funny. Was looking at it, it's yeah. a couple hysterical. car batteries in the backpack to power it. It's so <laughs> funny. Well, you can buy that dongle. I can't remember the name. I have one at home. Uh, the, right. Just, uh, Luna Display. Luna I have display. one too. Yeah, yeah. yeah I it bought it because really of good. you, Laurie. <laughs> uh, the only advantage Duet still has, and du it's sad because Duet kind of got Sherlocked by this, but it does work with Windows as well. So yeah. there's a small and it does number. Work with multi touch, as far as I recall, right? Ah, and the Duet, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah you, can not. Use, okay. you can use Duet display with a touch screen. And, and so, yeah, I think you know, I, it is, it, it's one of those weird situations where, on the one hand, you do feel bad for developers when they've worked so hard on this amazing feature, this amazing app. And then Apple just comes in with like a, a, a something that's not even nearly as cool, and they get lots of like hurrahs for it. You know, Duet Display has this amazing um, second screen app that does a lot more than Sidecar does. Um, uh, what this to me, what this means is, Duet Display is for people who have always been wanting to use a second screen with their iPhone or with their iPad and their Mac computer and they've always needed it and they they have it and they have amazing control and they have all these features and sidecar is for people who never really needed it before and now there's just this thing that they can do. So, you know, it, it's actually a benefit to companies like Duet Display for or for being able to like 
okay, so Apple has Sidecar, but look what we can do. It's way better. So people who have never used it before, they try Sidecar and they go, well, this is really cool. And then they go, wait, Duet Display does this too? This is even better. I'm going to go use that now, even though I never thought of it before. So hopefully yeah. that's a, a, a boon for the for the Sherlock um, developers, you know? Yeah. I, I love the idea of being able to get on an airplane with a laptop and a uh, and a, and an iPad Pro and have a dual screen set up on my tray yeah. table. <laughs> it's a little greedy, but it's good. <laughs> no, or or just I've I've used that display. I've used that setup when I'm traveling, where I've got like yeah. a book project and I just need a second display for reference or I need a second. I will not I will not bring like a six thousand dollar monitor in a Pelican case, but I <laughs> it's a, it's but I will I will probably already be taking my iPad just to watch movies on the on the plane. Yeah. So it just adds so much value just for the cost of at worst, like another USB cable, maybe. Yeah. Anything we're... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't hide. <laughs> anything anything we're shopping. <laughs> no, actually, I'm installing Duet Display. I forgot I, I could put this on my Windows machine. You know, what you, what you, what you should do is you should have like a st life-size sticker of like your face and your shoulders up on the back. So when yeah. you do have it held up... Just oh, your put, emoji. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to wrap it up because we're, you know, we've already gone a bit of a way and there's millions of things we haven't talked about. But... Uh, I'll give each one of you a chance to say anything that we haven't talked about yet from WWDC or a highlight of WWDC. Let's start with Renee and Laurie because they were there. Renee? Uh, no, I mean, we talked about all the biggest stuff um, as far as I was concerned. And there was just uh, – there's a bunch of HomePod stuff and AirPod stuff that's really cool. Like you can now connect multiple AirPods. Uh, you'll be able to do handoffs. So if you're listening on your HomePod, you can bring your iPhone next to it. It'll transfer whatever you're listening to to your iPhone, sorry. And then you can just go with it. And when you come back, you can do the same thing. HomePod has multi-user. Apple TV has multi-user. And I think we'll hear more about that as we get into the fall. Because I think there's still some of those features they haven't even announced yet. Lori, something, uh, something you thought was good that we didn't mention? Uh, the Cycles. Um, it's actually not its own separate app, but the Cycles um, on the watch. health tracking yeah. thing that, that's actually on. It's not just on your watch. It's also on your iPhone. So for people, oh, for women okay. who don't have an Apple Watch, they can track their cycles on their phone. So that, to me, is a really great thing for women's health. So I'm yeah. glad you mentioned it. Yeah, uh, Cycles. The, and I love the, sa the uh, audio sound uh, pressure meter on the Apple Watch to let warn you if you're in a noisy, a dangerous, noisy environment. Yeah, that's another, again, I, I was really excited to, to find, we kind of knew about cycles, but we didn't know about the noise um, feature. Right. And uh, I immediately thought, oh, I can't wait. I mean, I'm you're going to need that, I, like, except you're going to not you're going to be on stage singing and it's going to go. It's going to be bright red constantly. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so fun to just like see what it does, because I'm always in environments like that, like yeah. three times a week. Do you so wear earplugs? It's going to be really fun. Do you protect your I hearing? I do. I always wear earplugs. Please. Yeah. I, Thank you. I didn't. So here's the here's the thing real quick on that. Um, I didn't used to, and I do have tinnitus. I have a constant yeah, ringing in my ear. Too. And too if I could that. go back in time and yeah. tell my younger self, mm -hmm. just wear earplugs, mm -hmm. I would be so happy. And I didn't. And I tell everyone when I see them, young people, any they're not wearing earplugs, I give them my story of if I could do anything to go back in time and stop my ears from ringing yep. all the time, I would have done that yep. because it's a very irritating experience. And I think this noise app is a really great example or a way to tell you, hey, maybe you should put your earplugs in or yep. hey, you should remember to put your earplugs in. And for some people, they're never going to do it and they're going to end up like me and they're going to wish they, they did. But for a lot of people, they're not going to realize, they're not going to remember, oh, I'm in this environment that's really loud. And this will just go, you know, it's been five minutes and this this decibel level is above 92. Do Huge. you want to put your earplugs in? Yeah. So it's a, it's going to be really great for for hearing health, I think. If even... One per one fewer p person has tinnitus <laughs> yeah. because of this. Apple's done their job here. I have a constant ringing in my ears at all times as well. And uh, yeah. and it was probably for the same reason because I was a singer in a punk band. No, probably for the same reason because <laughs> I when I listened to music at a young age, I loved to sit right next to the speakers and get as loud as I could. I loved the feeling. And, of course, I'd leave every concert with ringing ears, but I thought, well, that'll go away and yeah. I'll... You know, but some sometimes and it, it did when we were younger. Yeah, yeah, it did when we were younger, and then one day you wake up. Yeah, and you hear a ringing in your ear, and you think, "Oh no, what Yikes. happened?" And then it Yikes. never goes away after that. Yikes! 
Andy, uh, anything in particular you think uh, we maybe missed in covering WWDC? Uh, probably voice control, because uh, which kind of I c came and went through my awareness while I was watching it. But the more that I've been uh, reading about people like Stephen Aquino, who uh, does such really wonderful work covering covering accessibility uh, on uh, Apple products, uh, it really does seem to be a uh, are almost a reinvention of uh, uh, being able to control the Mac, being able to control uh, your iOS devices with just your voice for people who have problems uh, operating the devices with their hands and all the subtle things that are happening uh, under uh, under the hood to make it happen of just trying to figure out when is the user actually paying attention to the device and trying to control uh, this with an alternative method as opposed to here's a here's a here is a wake word we have to use to enable this sort of a feature feature to prevent it from uh, turning on and turning off uh, unnecessarily. I'm still trying to get behind it. Uh, again, I, I'm, uh, I uh, rely on people like Steve Aquino to really to show me uh, exactly how these things work. I subscribe to the uh, the access his uh, accessible podcast. I keep forgetting he does it with uh, Timothy Buck as well. Uh, and this is he has they have a great episode, I think, just from last week. Yeah, just last week, uh, they actually interviewed uh, Sarah Her Herlinger uh, from Apple uh, about the whole feature. So it's uh, it's more impressive than I I first caught on. I'm not, but I'm not qualified to speak about it. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. And, and that's uh, I I think it's interesting that Apple has this coherent plan to make access make that iPad accessible or iOS accessible from keyboard. I guess not your phone but from keyboard from uh touch and from voice that's yeah. it's fun yeah it's all of it yeah that's really yeah. cool it's like blade runner leo zoom enhance yeah it, zoom <laughs> but yeah we, we we talk we talk about how wonderful it's going to be to be able to use an ipad with a mouse but the ability to use an assistive pointing device that can do the touches for you is an it's an it is it's in it's the feature is inside accessibility for a reason uh and i'm glad that it is opening up the device to people who would have found that device a lot more difficult to use otherwise yeah very important all right. Also, uh, I'm not a gaming nerd, so maybe you guys anticipated this, but the difference in cheers for PlayStation 4 over Xbox controllers uh, <laughs> was stunning to me. No, that's just an installed base issue, honestly. <laughs> okay. It's just a, it's all about the installed base. Uh, no trouble. There just happened to be a lot of um, PlayStation fans at that particular keynote or something. Uh, it's PlayStation <laughs> outsells Xbox. And those work on iOS as well as Apple TV, which is cool. Yeah. No, I think that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, I'm very excited yeah. about that. Uh, let's take a break. Your pick's coming up. Lori's going to tell me what to buy next. <laughs> but first, a word from WordPress. I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you that if you do not have a website as an individual or a business, you're kind of missing out on this whole internet thing. You might have heard of it. Uh, yeah, you say, no, I have Facebook. I have Twitter. No, no, no. I mean a website, a place where people Google your name or business they go there. They find it. They see your best stuff. They see your menus. They see your hours. They make reservations. They buy stuff. They, they. If you're a, a young person, they see your, you know, your your video of your uh, track milestone, you know, or stuff that shows off your best side. You've got to have a website. Everybody does, and there's no better place to make that website than WordPress.com. WordPress was created. How many years ago now? 15, 20, almost 20 years ago was created to let anyone pursue whatever they, it is they love by launching a site that's free to start with room to grow. WordPress.com makes it absolutely easy. No two-week trials, no hidden fees. WordPress owners, own, users own their own content forever. You, you can create a site free to start, but there's lots of room to grow. I actually... Started free, too, 12 years ago when I started at WordPress.com. Now I'm a, a business subscriber because I want all the all the great features, including e-commerce offered for businesses, powerful site-building tools, unlimited number of themes, plugins, 24-7 support. Actually, everybody gets that. 24-7 support from real WordPress experts. 300 of them ready to help you with your site. So you're never alone. WordPress is really Right. And if you know a teenager, somebody starting a life out and they don't have a website, this would be a great gift. Maybe for dad, for Father's Day. Dad, I, I, I set up a WordPress site for you. WordPress.com. 
It's so flexible, so powerful. Some of the biggest companies on the on the earth use it to build their websites. Fortune.com, which just uh, when Ferry was here with Fast Company, they use it. Uh, Quartz uses it. Millions of people use WordPress.com every day to turn their dreams into reality. I got my 12-year uh, logo. I've been there 12 years. It gets started now. 12 years from now, you'll, you could say, I've been there 12 years. WordPress.com slash MacBreak. Actually, when you use that address, you let them know you saw it here, which is great, but you also get 15% off any new plan purchase. We love you, WordPress. WordPress.com slash MacBreak. 15% off your new WordPress site. My site is leolaporte.com. I just, I just love it. It's so easy to use. WordPress.com slash MacBreak. Okay, Laurie, I got my checkbook out. Laurie McGill. McGill. Why do I call you McGill? <laughs> Laurie Gill. I don't know, but I like it. Let's Laurie McGill. It. Let's call me McGill from Actually, now on. <laughs> Gill's short for your real last name, isn't it? That's is that correct. a secret? My real last name is Gil Patrick. Oh, you don't have to say it out uh, loud. You no, know, but... I just... I think, no, I think Gil is just a fun little short way to remember my name, and it sounds really cool. And uh, my dad's nickname in high school was Gil, and Aww. my brother nicknamed me Little Gil <laughs> when I was in high school. I've, just, I've been calling myself Gil for a very long time, so... <laughs> no, I love it. And the only yeah. reason I know that is uh, is in our car in correspondence with Elisa, because uh, we're setting you up with the uh, you know that PayPal yeah. account because you live in Canada. <laughs> Lisa <laughs> said, "No, I know." Lisa said, "Wait a minute, Lori doesn't live in Canada." I said, "No, I know. She's just up the road." <laughs> so yeah, I, I said how I I was looking forward to meeting her in person, and she's like, "Yeah, someday, you know, when we go to visit someday. Canada, or you can visit us." <laughs> I don't, like, know. I don't know. Right up the road. <laughs> no, I don't know how that happened. But anyway, yeah. uh, what do you, what is your pick, Ms. Gilpatrick? Well, when I when I fly to come visit you, yes, fly all <laughs> the. Bring... You could fly. It's not a long flight. Oh God, no! It would take longer just to get to the airport yes, to go. That's right. <laughs> see you. That's right. But when I go flying, I will be using Flytunes, and Leo, you probably will want to see something like this too. What? So it's. Wireless Bluetooth transmitter, which does exist in the world. That's not that big of a deal. Um, this one's made by Scotia, and they're, they're a pretty darn good company. Yeah. Um, this particular version allows you to pair two Bluetooth speakers to any device that is, um, th it only has a 3.5 millimeter jack. So um, in this case, they're specifically talking about airplanes um, because they don't, you can't get Bluetooth on an airplane when you're trying to watch the movies. Um, you can use it with like exercise devices or even your receiver at home that, you know, if it's really old and it doesn't have a Bluetooth connection like mine, um, you can plug this into the 3.5 millimeter jack and it becomes a Bluetooth transmitter for your headphones. This one lets you do it with two sets of headphones. So you and your wife or you and your kids or whatever um, can be sitting next to each other on the plane watching the same movie using two, two separate sets of Bluetooth headphones and you're kind of free to roam. Um, the really special thing about this one, I think it actually has two folding prongs. Um, so it will work with the, the, diver, the different variety of, um, airplanes that oh, have different yeah. plugins. Yeah. And it also comes with an additional, um, cord adapter. So if you're using something that, you know, the, the, um, 3.5 millimeter jacket is a very small little space it'll still fit because you use this little um, cord adapter that will kind of give you the the extender dongle. And they've confirmed that it does work with Nintendo Switch, which I'm very excited about because uh, there's not a lot of Bluetooth transmitters that actually work oh. with Nintendo Switch. So that's a really big deal to go ahead. And, and this means things like using your um, AirPods or in my case, your Powerbeats Pro with your Nintendo Switch which is kind of awesome to listen to the music, the uh, Breath of the Wild music or the uh, um, uh, Animal Crossing music while you're while you're playing games. Don't laugh. I'm sorry. Oh, he's I'm laughing sorry. at the, that. He's laughing at this. The expression, this, this the expression video. of the guy, like, oh, I'm so happy to be using headphones. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> <laughs> We're watching the uh, the advertising uh, video for Flatoons. But actually, I'm going to, you know what, Lori? I am going to buy this. This will go very nicely with my Infinity Scarf pillow uh, for my next flight. I am I am ready. Put it in your, yeah, put it in your airplane bag. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. Wow. How much are they? 
I think they're 30, 40. They shouldn't be too uh, expensive because these devices in general aren't, aren't hideously expensive. Yeah, it's 30. That's true. 40. Like, keep yeah. in mind that you, you also, you get what you pay for and the good yes. quality comes in the technology behind it, which anything that supports Nintendo Switch is, it has a little bit of extra juice to it <laughs> to make it work really well. Cause that's not a, that's not an easy thing to do. Oh, okay. Um, there's also, you know, lag issues. And so, um, right. I haven't gone into the details on what um, what they use for uh, lag avoidance, but um, I believe it's so it's I think it says on here somewhere. I'm sorry I wasn't prepared for for checking that, but um, <laughs> it's that's also a good thing. So um, at forty dollars, um, you are, you're getting about the right price for it. Yeah. It's for something that has that kind it's of. It's Bluetooth you know. four point one, probably not five, but I don't know. And and by the way, that's an important point: is that you are allowed to use Bluetooth on an airplane. Mm -hmm. I yep. think some, you know, you put on airplane mode, it turns every radio off, but you can turn the Bluetooth back on. Mm -hmm. uh, if they, in fact, the other day I was on a plane and they said you you can you can use Bluetooth. Like I guess people don't know that. So Goodness. some of the flights they still say no, but it seems oh, really? arbitrary to me at this point. Yeah, it's probably Air Canada. <laughs> Air Canada sometimes says yes, sometimes says no. It's They're funny. Too. They say take off your headphones while we're taking off and landing. We want you to pay attention if we crash. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, because you, you don't need people to say sorry to while you're exiting the plane, Leo. It's like it's, it's big business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Renee, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Renee, by the way, are, you're rooting for the Raptors probably, right? Uh, their basketball team? Yeah, okay, good. Okay. You may now give us your pick of the week. <laughs> Go Canada. Um, so uh, longtime watchers of this show know this, but I, I used to be a Flash developer for a very brief period of time. Um, and since we've, you know, we've murdered Flash just to watch it die, there's been sort of what tool do you use? And for a long time now, I've been using uh, Hype instead. It's by Tumult. Uh, it's former Apple engineers. They do a really, really good job. Really, really smart team. And they've just come out with Hype 4. And I was going to do this whole thing like, yeah, you can believe the hype and like a whole public enemy riff, but I'm going to save all of us that embarrassment and just talk about um, this is what I always wanted in a, a design tool for the web to make animations, to make rich experiences, to make movement, to make all of that cool stuff because – it does it using native web technologies and it does it so beautifully, so lightly, so that the performance is great. I mean, there's we have so many technologies now from Canvas to CSS transforms to all these really cool way of building fully interactive sites, like the kind you used to see for restaurants and movies without sort of the overheads and the plugin architectures and the, the malware vectors that all of those introduced. And they just keep adding really, really cool features. Um, the latest version has better polygons, better pass, better pencil tool, better shape morphing, line animations, physics. It's If I was still doing this kind of stuff, I would be so far all over this. But I'm super happy that they're still making it because uh, we need a tool like this. And they really think through and sweat all the little details. So if, if you're into this, if you want to make these these really cool, you can use it for anything. You don't have to use it for the web. It's just, it's really at home there. Uh, just check out Hype 4. Brand new. I think it came out yesterday. So it's fresh off the assembly line. And it's got just all those really thoughtful things that Tumult is so great at. And But then when you make this thing, is it for websites? What are you, what, what are you? Yeah, it's usually for, yeah, it's usually for the more dynamic, like entertainment driven. So it, it uh, would, standard web browsers would be able to play it back? Yeah, it's basically Flash it's for HTML5. Flash. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but it's, oh, it's I get it. The output's HTML5. Oh, yeah. nice. Oh, that's yeah, really cool. It's, it's web native technologies. Everything, almost, I think pretty much everything you could do with Flash. Maybe some of the scripting would have to be JavaScript instead of Flash script, but it's just all native. It's tremendous. Oh, that's really nice. So you still get all yeah. the uh, capabilities of Flash and you don't have to write hand code HTML5, it'll do that for you. That's neat. Yep. That's neat. Really nice. Uh-oh. Andy, what's the matter? Sorry. What's the matter? Um, I might be losing the room soon. Okay, quickly, give oh, us your okay. pick. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, no, there's someone at the door. Uh, there is a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, when, uh, when Apple, it looks like a false alarm. I think it was just like a little girl with oh, like a teddy bear. Oh, good. I was okay. just curious as to what was going on. <laughs> the teddy uh, bears are the, here for their uh, Andy yeah, 12 o'clock. Okay. 
It's like, uh, so uh, so uh, when uh, Apple made its announcement about uh, iTunes is dead, 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 we're finally dead. Uh, I've started looking into other music players just because I realized I haven't really looked into other music players. Yeah. Uh, and I know that all of the features of, of all the functionality of being able to play music locally on your uh, on your MacBook, on your Mac, is still going to be there within the music app. But I did find an app called the Pine Player that I really like because – it's uh, uh, the one fault of iTunes I could never get around is that it really wants to always add stuff to your library. Whereas if uh, I travel around with a 256 gig flash drive that has my entire music library on it because I can't afford to keep uh, that much storage tied up on my MacBook. But sometimes I just want to, oh, here's like a really obscure album I kind of feel like playing right now. Do I really have to add it to my iTunes library just so I can listen to it for the next couple of hours? Uh, Pine Player is based on files, so you just drag things into it, and it plays whole albums, playlists oh, that you've created. Nice. Uh, the interface is really, really cool. Uh, it supports a, a multitude of very, very, very like high-quality formats, even ones that are kind of obscure. It can play SACDs directly, uh, and I like, and it keeps getting updated. The last update was just. Uh, or at least in the developer channel was just uh, about a week or so ago, and there, there's something uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe the user interface. There's just something about how uh, it has no like <laughs> has no 3D colors and panels whooshing in and out. It's just it looks like what a sound mixer, like a sound designer in a studio, would want to have as their personal music player. It's not complicated, but it's not afraid to put a button someplace if you need to have a button someplace. Uh, and it's free, uh, so for all that, uh, it's a, it's just a free thing to have on your on your uh, laptop. Uh, so I downloaded it last week, and I've been using it actually a lot more than I thought I'd be using it, uh, even though I've got uh, the as I've said before. I've got Plex as my main like music system uh, for the entire house and for most of my mobile devices. But I f keep finding lots of ways that I want to use it. Like I just downloaded something off of SoundCloud and I want to listen to it or I've just load, uh, got some podcasts or something from my flash drive. Uh, so nice stuff. Uh, so that's my pick for the week. That's really sweet. Does it whip yes. the llama's butt though? <laughs> I don't, you know, llamas, I don't think they need their butts whipped. I think that you, you talk to them, you try to understand why they're upset, and you solve the problems from a point of respect. Because yeah, they'll spit at you if you whip their Well, even, even spitting. It's, it's, you want to find, you want to do one of these, you know? <laughs> Peace, one of these. Love, and llama, one across llama. the bridges. Yes, exactly. uh, that's, I'm downloading that. I use Vox on uh, iOS and, uh, and uh, Mac, but that's, a, you pay for it and, you pay for it, and there's a whole lot of, oh, set up your Vox account. Oh, you yeah. have to set up a Vox yeah. account, but I can't. Yeah. This is, hi, I've made a music player. Drag a drag it. a folder, drag an album into it. I will yeah. play the album for you. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, my pick comes from yes from uh, earlier today when we had iOS Today, and we interviewed Rosemary Orchard, who's really fantastic. She does a podcast so on good. Relay FM. Yeah, you know her? Yeah, I was so impressed. Yeah. And we were talking about shortcuts and, and – uh, Automation, but one of the things that she talked a lot about, which was news to me, is using JavaScript to automate iOS. Uh, if if shortcuts won't do what you need to do, turns out JavaScript has low level access to a lot of routines on iOS, and it, it is very powerful. And the tool you'll want, which is available uh, for the App Store, is called Scriptable. It allows you to automate iOS using JavaScript. Now, it's simple JavaScript. You don't have to be a JavaScript guru. And, of course, it comes with a lot of sample scripts to give you a sense of uh, what you can do. But I was really impressed. So if you if you use shortcuts, but you're maybe ready to take the next level, um, I, I will be delving into this. I haven't played with it yet, but uh, after talking to Rosemary, I was kind of an eye-opener. Um, and, of course, sh shortcuts is getting smarter and smarter. But if you do, uh, for instance, if you use drafts, which I'm a huge fan of, uh, you can use scriptable, scriptable to create new drafts actions because those are in JavaScript, things like that. And it uses, it gives you uh, access to a huge number of native uh, frameworks. So I, th I think it's uh, it's pretty impressive. They, this is an example. These are this is in the app. Some of the examples. I know you'll like this one. Loads the latest XKCD comic and shows it in a uh, in a pop up, and then has Siri read it. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that this is using the Quick Look API. Uh, so and look how short that script is. I mean, anybody you don't have to be a JavaScript uh, guru to write that. Don't worry. There's no, you know, you don't have to manage the DOM or anything like that. This is really cool. Uh, scriptable. It's a it's a it's a free download. I don't know if there's in-app purchases or not, but 
I'm looking forward to playing with this a little bit. I'm I'm very impressed. It's kind of like Pythonista, which is a Python uh, for uh, Mac OS, uh, but it, but even more capable. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Really appreciate it. We do Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday right after iOS today. That's usually around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1700 UTC. The live stream, audio and video, available at twit.tv slash live. Or you can ask your Amazon Echo. You could say, Echo, listen to Twit Live, and it'll just play it automatically, which is pretty sweet. Uh, you can also ask for the latest version of Mac Break Weekly or any of our podcasts the same way from any of your smart devices. I don't know, does Siri do podcasts yet? Can I just say listen? Yep. You could say, hey, yep. Shlomo, listen to Mac Break Weekly podcast. Good. Do it every week. Nice. Yeah, set an automatic shortcut for it. You could do that too, automatically. In, in iOS 13. Automatically. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the only way to listen. We also have uh, copies of the show audio and video available at twit.tv slash mbw. And, of course, if you have a podcast app you like, including the Apple Podcast app, you can always subscribe. In fact, would you do that for us? That way you'll get every episode automatically, the instant it's available. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Renee, at imore.com. Always a pleasure. The Vector podcast, imore.com slash vector. Lori oh, I had Bud Tribble on this week. Oh, if nobody saw ooh, it, we got to talk legendary. about privacy. And yeah, I was shocked. I was not expecting it. It was a surprise. And then he came out, and I was told I had 30 minutes to chat with him about privacy, and I just took advantage of it. Big shot. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's really exciting. Okay. Uh, that's imore.com slash vector. I must listen. Yeah. Or watch. Lori Gill, she's also at imore, where she is the managing editor. And uh, Sick Cure, Sick Burn, playing anytime soon? Uh, we actually are on a little bit of a hiatus. Our next show is not until the 21st of June. So yeah, we, and we've been off for a couple of weeks, but we're writing new songs and we're recording an album next weekend. So <gasps> that's exciting. Yeah. That's a good reason yeah, to be taking some time off for, yeah. for the studio and the recording studio. Even the Rolling Stones do that. Yeah, <laughs> got to take some time off. Got it. Only we don't take a month to write it to record an album. We take two days. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that even is a lot. I mean, I think the first Beatles album was less than two hours. So you know, yeah, you yeah. Know. Thank you, Lori, and of course, Andy Anako, WGBH Boston. When are you appearing on the radio this week? Uh, tomorrow on Wednesday, I think I'm from one to one thirty, and that's also, that's also going to be at the Boston Public Library studio. So if you are in Boston and you want to get a cup of coffee and a cookie and watch me a gesture with my hands, even though I know we're on radio, uh, go on down. Fantastic. <laughs> As always, it's a real pleasure. All three of you. Uh, thank you all for watching the show. We had a nice studio audience to do uh, too today. If you want to be here, tickets at twit.tv. Just email us. Would have put a chair out for you. But now I'm sad to say it's time to go back to work because guess what? Break time is over. Let's see. Oh, no. oh <laughs> heaven, heaven forfend. <laughs> <laughs>